start off just kind of by looking at the application landscape that most enterprises today are, are facing. Um, and that landscape is starting to become really kind of the matrix from hell. And what I mean by that, the amount of applications that enterprises are being asked to deploy is growing. Right? We know software is eating the world. We know that more and more applications are being asked or being developed and being deployed inside of enterprises. And so if you kind of looked at this as a graph, on the vertical axis here, the types of applications that people are deploying are growing, growing upwards. Especially as we start to move into microservices, cloud native applications, maybe functions as a service, the more and more subcomponents of a particular application is also growing. So not, not only are enterprises being asked to deploy more applications than ever before, they're being asked to deploy more components of each application. And then on, on the horizontal axis of, of this kind of graph, and we're often finding enterprises are being asked to deploy their applications to more and more places. Traditionally, it was, well, deploy in our data center and, and maybe our, our DR data center. But now we're finding enterprises are being asked to deploy in a variety of different physical locations, sort of data centers, public clouds, private clouds, as well as a lot of different types of devices. As well, it could be edge devices, could be end user devices. There's kind of a whole remit of, of places where software is being deployed where people previously haven't had to worry about getting software. So we kind of end up in this matrix. Enterprises are being asked to deploy more and more applications, and they're being asked to deploy them in, in more and more places. So the question then becomes, how can we start to standardize our applications? How can we start to standardize our application deployment processes? And how can we start to standardize our devices so we don't have to worry about packaging all these different things for all these different places. And that's exactly where Docker comes in. That's exactly where containers come in. Um, now, the, the analogy works quite well here with shipping containers. And, and what I mean by this is, if you think of a traditional shipping container, uh, prior to this, people, when they wanted to transport goods around the world, um, there was kind of no real way or, or standard unit to, to ship goods. This shipping container came in, and all of a sudden, people could build infrastructure around it. If you wanted to transport, I don't know, a thousand bananas, or you wanted to transport a car, you didn't have to create new ships, cranes, trains, etc., to carry those goods. That one shipping container became a standard packaging format for you to move goods around. Um, so therefore, all you have to do is design the processes once to move that particular shipping container, and you didn't really care what was inside. Now, that, that, that absolutely kind of works quite well with software containers. A, a Docker container can run all sorts of applications, and we really don't mind what's running inside. Whether it's a modern cloud-native Java application, whether it's a legacy .NET 2 framework, a Windows application, we, we honestly don't mind what's inside the container. But the thing is, you package it up, you deploy it, you manage it the same way. And so therefore, as you're being start, started to ask to deploy more and more applications and more and more application types, you only have to worry now about one packaging standard, that one packaging standard being the Docker container. And then when you start to look at your infrastructure, all we have to do is understand how to automate and how to deploy these containers. And once you've done that, you can now deploy that same bit of software anywhere without custom build scripts, custom deployment scripts, or anything like that. We can use this, this idea of a container to abstract our software away from the infrastructure. Um, at kind of a, a high level, like one of the first questions we get asked when we start to talk about containers, uh, is this going to replace my uh, virtualization environment? Is this kind of the new version of virtual machines? Um, and one thing I'll say to that is they are quite different, and they're not mutually exclusive. If you try to treat containers like virtual machines, you're going to run into some gotchas pretty quickly. A container is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application all packaged up. We're not packaging up an operating system. We're not packaging up a kernel. It is completely, completely separate. 
if you picture a, a traditional virtual machine, something you can see like on the far right hand side of this slide, uh, you can see here that the application binaries and OS are all tied together as a single packaging unit. And if you wanted to move that virtual machine around, then you're, you're moving the full operating system with it. A container, on the other hand, is just the application and the binaries and libraries. So for example, that could be um, the IIS web server layer and your application content. It could be uh, the Java framework and, and your application. We're not packaging up the operating system, and we're not packaging up the kernel. So what that gives us now is a really lightweight artifact, um, an, an artifact that contains everything required to run your application. You no longer have to move around that instruction manual with your application code, because all of the dependencies for your application will be installed inside of that particular container image. Container images often run side by side on the same host, and because of the security processes built in to the operating system, those containers do not see each other. For example, you could be running, I don't know, Java 8 in one container and Java 10 in a second container, and there'll be no conflicts, you'll have no problems about interdependencies and, and kind of a, a nightmare trying to upgrade them. They are completely isolated units that can be started and stopped independently, can be running completely different versions, um, but are just sharing the underlying host. Now, a container host could be a physical server, it could be a virtual server, could be a cloud instance. We honestly don't mind. Um, obviously, you get a layer of multi-tenancy and isolation as, as part of containerization. So a lot of people uh, ask the question, why do I need a hypervisor and um, uh, uh, I guess uh, containerization to provide isolation? Can't I do it once? Uh, absolutely, you can. Um, but we often find today when people are starting out with containers and people are starting out with Docker, that they deploy the containers today in a virtual environment. They, they provision a few guest operating systems or cloud instances, uh, install the Docker engine, and we'll get to that bit in a moment, and then have everything required to start to run uh, their containers. And so kind of then the question becomes, well, what, what benefits does this bring? Like, why, why should I look at Docker? Why should I look at containerization? What am, what am I getting at this? Um, and, and this slide I've, I've split in half. Uh, first, I'm talking about infrastructure, and, and then secondly, talking a bit about agility. Um, when we look at infrastructure, uh, traditionally today, the way that we've always deployed software, even, uh, even back when we were doing it on physical servers prior to virtualization, you always deployed one application per, per host, one application per physical server, and then it became one application per virtual server. With containerization, because we're able to securely package up and isolate each application, we're able to run more applications per host. Now, this diagram right here shows four uh, applications on, on, on a single virtual machine, but in the wild, we see people run an awful lot more than that. Um, so the kind of the first benefit you get out of containerization, a consolidation of infrastructure. We see customers kind of consolidate by up to 75% of their virtual estates when they move to containerization. Now, there's obviously huge benefits that come from this. You now have reduced your operating system spend. You don't have to license your, your enterprise operating systems as, as much because you're running less virtual machines. You also reduced your operating um, time as well, um, your operating model. You're no longer having to patch all of those virtual machines. You've now got smaller VMs, to uh, less VMs to worry about, therefore less time taken to patch hosts. And then obviously at, at the end of this, we're starting to drive up server utilization. We often see virtual machines being quite highly uh, oversubscribed or over provisioned, sorry. And then when applications are deployed on them, there's an awful lot of idle CPU and idle memory. Because we can start to pack multiple applications per virtual machine, we start to drive up the utilization of your infrastructure. Now, especially when you start to look in the, the public cloud and, and cloud instance world, where you're actually getting charged per virtual machine, the more applications per virtual machine you can run and the higher utilization, they're all, all real strong, strong perks. 
Then on the other side, there's also a, a huge agility and um, a benefit that comes to containerization. Because we now have a, 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 a standard packaging unit, we can absolutely reduce the time taken to patch your applications. Um, a, a, and we'll get to it shortly, but a container is actually defined in a clear text file. And all we need to do is just rebuild that container image every time we want to patch it. Let's say you wanted to move from version 1 to version 2 of a container. You don't jump into the container and run an upgrade process. All you do is you change your, your instruction file and rebuild. We're now reducing the time taken to patch applications because all we need to do is rebuild once and then redeploy everywhere. And because we have this standard deployment um, uh, artifact, we, we can then reduce the time taken to deploy your applications. One pipeline, one tool set, one set of automation can actually be used to deploy all of, of your uh, application workloads. You no longer have to have separate deployment tools uh, for each, each application. When people start to look at Docker and, and containerization, they also start to look at CI/CD pipelines. And Docker provides native integration to existing and, and new pipeline tool sets. So as customers start to, to create applications or start to move to agile uh, workflows and, and start to develop applications quickly, and they can absolutely include Docker and containers as part of that, whether they're using their pipelines to build uh, container images, using their pipelines to deploy containerized applications, we often see those things come hand in hand. And as I discussed, this is standardization across your application estate. Whether it's cloud native applications or legacy applications, both of those are absolutely suited and can run absolutely fine in, in Docker. Uh, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking through some of the traditional common use cases we see for containerization. Um, uh, starting in, in, in the uh, top left-hand corner here, and that is modernizing as existing or traditional applications. An acronym we use internally is MTA. Uh, you may see on any of our, our websites and blog posts. Um, and this is a, a common use case where uh, customers want to lift and shift existing applications into containers. For example, let's say that you've got, uh, I don't know, a, a .NET 2 framework application running out there today on, on Server 2008. You don't want to rewrite that application um, to, to run on a modern operating system because that's quite costly and expensive and time consuming. Ideally, you just want to lift and shift that application into, a, 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 into its same framework but running on a, on a new box. And that's exactly what we can do with Docker. Uh, we have a, a whole section dedicated to this, and I think it's uh, session six in the webinar series, but we'll talk more there about how we can take an existing application, lift and shift it into a container, running the old framework on a modern host. And so one of the key use cases we see for Docker is, is when customers uh, are, are using containerization to, to abstract legacy applications from their infrastructure and move them to new environments, new clouds, and uh, new deployment models. Uh, other use cases we see for Docker in, in, include um, integrating as part of a cloud strategy. People use containerization really for, for kind of two, two key, key things on, on, on part of their cloud strategy. First, uh, as a migration tool, customers uh, want to find a quicker way to get their applications from the data center into a, into a cloud. Um, and because we talked about the packaging format and the, the speed of deployment, we often see people, as part of their migration, migrate their application into a container and then can deploy it anywhere. You don't have to worry about any of the uh, odd deployment scripts in each environment, package it up as a container, and you're good to go. At that same time, because containers abstract you away from the infrastructure, they actually prevent you from being locked into a particular cloud. So when customers are starting to look at hybrid cloud or multi-cloud models, um, people use containerization to avoid themselves being locked into a, a, a particular, uh, particular platform. Uh, we, we looked at the, the reducing data center expenses. We looked at the infrastructure savings that you can get from moving to containerization, that reduction in, in, in virtual machine infrastructure or server footprint, and the drive-up of utilization as we start to run more applications per, per host. Uh, moving to the right-hand side of this slide, we can now start to see um, other things, including sort of 
faster application development and delivery. We see containerization go hand in hand with microservices, cloud native applications, cloud native development, agile development. Um, and so when customers start to look at developing software in that way, they would like a standard packaging format for each one of their microservices. And they want those kind of microservices to be integrated into their pipeline. So absolutely, we see people, when they start to, to move down uh, that, that agile or DevOps frameworks, start to embrace containerization. And, and that really comes hand in hand with the, with the mod, uh, modernizing software supply chain. A lot of people today are, are looking for uh, new ways to develop software quicker or distribute software quicker. Um, and so containerization come in with its standard packaging format reduce the time taken to develop software, reduce the time taken to distribute software. Uh, the sixth use case or the bottom use case there on, on the slide is one of the new ones we're starting to see inside of Docker. Um, as people are starting to, to use containerization in the data center, they're wondering if they can start to use some of this technology and some of these benefits on the edge. If they can use or package up their applications using a Docker container and deploy them using standard automation tools, can they use this to start to package up software that they need to distribute out to the edge? We originally kind of saw this on oil rigs, and now it started to move across to all sorts of things, sort of cruise ships, manufacturing sites. We're seeing ways that, that people want to start to distribute software out to the edge, and a container image and its distribution mechanisms provide a great way of getting software out there. You don't have to now worry about um, kind of releasing your software to all these different environments. You package it up once in the container and then just push it out. Oh, cool. Um, this is just a, a slide just going a bit more detail into that modernized traditional applications play. I said we do actually have a whole um, webinar dedicated to this, uh, which is the sixth one in the series. Uh, but here just kind of highlights what I was talking about before. The idea that you could take an, a legacy framework, so an application, in this case running on, on .NET Framework 2.0, lift and shift the, just those two components, i.e. the application and .NET Framework 2.0, but now run this in a container on a modern host. In this environment, we're actually removing things like Windows Server 2008 and replacing it with Windows Server 2016 or 2019. But the application has not had to be rewritten. Because we're running the same framework on both sides, the application can carry on as it used to. And this kind of leads us on to what I say is kind of the vision right now here in Docker. Um, and this is that any app, any operating system, any infrastructure is, is what, we're, what we can containerize. And so you can see the various different application types and going from traditional applications, microservices, COTS applications, blockchain serverless, whatever it be, all these various different application types that people are now starting to put into containers. And then they use the Docker platform to abstract themselves away from their infrastructure. Whether they're running these applications on cloud, virtual machine, bare metal, even now at the edge, this is kind of the, the goal, I guess, for, for Docker here is, is to package up all these different application types and abstract them away, um, away from, from the infrastructure. The three core design principles, which we also will cover in further on in the webinar series here, is that Docker platform is built on choice, agility, and security. We think that choice is important, whether that's choice around where you run your applications or what applications you want to package up. Um, agility, making sure it's quick and easy to package up your applications and deploy them anywhere. And security is key. We're, we're introducing new packaging formats, new levels of multi-tenancy. We need to make sure security is inbuilt by default in all of, all of our platforms. Cool. All right, I'm just going to uh, stop here and quickly have a look to see if there are any questions that are popped through into the panel. Oh, it's quite a few. Um, uh, the kind of question, is the Docker engine a kind of hypervisor? Uh, great question. I'm actually going to come back a little bit around um, what the Docker engine is and where it sits in the stack uh, as we kind of go through this next section. So hopefully we'll, this will answer some of those those uh, original questions. Um, so the diagram we showed before, VMs versus containers. A, a container is just your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application. Uh, all running on a shared uh, operating system. 
This diagram is actually slightly incorrect. The Docker engine is actually not in the I.O. path of your application. The Docker engine, as you can see in, in this diagram, is actually used to create, start, and stop containers. Once a container has been started, the Docker engine is completely out of the way. There is no performance overhead when containerizing an application. It's not like a hypervisor where you're running a full guest operating system. Therefore, there is added latency and, and, and CPU and, and memory constraints. Um, your application is, in theory, just running natively on the box. The Docker engine creates the container and then gets out of the way. It is, it is not in, in the I.O. path at all. So one of the then kind of questions that, that come up is, well, what, what is this idea of a container image? How do I build a container image? How do I get my application in into a container? Um, and when, when you kind of think about what, what you're actually doing here, you're actually running your application in its own isolated file system. It's uh, actually running kind of isolated away from the host. Each container has its own isolated root file system. They don't share them. Um, hence, that gives uh, an element of isolation. So how do you get your application in to a container, all we really have to do is install it in that in that in that in that uh, that root file system. Uh, the way that we actually do this um, is is actually through something we call a Docker file. Now, a Docker file is an instruction set on how to define a container image. A, a Docker file lives um, normally in source control. Normally, lives actually alongside your application. So if your application lived in like a, 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 a sort of source control repository, a Docker file would live there too. And the Docker file basically defines how to build a root file system containing that application. Remember, we're not packaging up the host. We're not packaging up the kernel. We're not packaging up the networking stack. We're just copying the application into its, into its file system. So just kind of like a, some simple instructions here, I, I've kind of said, well, what file system do I want to start from? And you could start from anything. In, in this situation, I've actually started from um, a really lightweight Linux distribution called Alpine. I've started there. That's going to be my root file system. Uh, I'm actually going to install a package from the package manager of, of this, this Linux distribution. The package I'm going to install is Nginx. So I, I now have a, a web server running inside of that file system. Um, I'm going to copy across my application code. So this is the bit that gets my application from uh, the uh, the, the, the building machine, wherever you build your container images, into the file system. So I'm just going to copy it from there into a container. And then a quick entry point that says when this container gets deployed, just start Nginx. Now, this bit of clear text is pretty simple. Everybody can collaborate with it. We can kind of see exactly how a container image is built. Um, and all we're really doing now is copying that application inside. Now, you could you could compile your application inside the file system. You could download it. There's many different ways for you to get that application in there. Uh, this is a very, very simple web service. So I've literally just copied it. I haven't had to do any kind of installation or anything like that. Um, then the kind of question comes, well, if I wanted to patch my application, pretty simple. I go back to my, my, my Docker file, and I would change things. Let's say I wanted to use a new version of, of Alpine. Simple. I just change my from line to a new version and rebuild. I, I don't go into the container and do an update. I don't uh, kind of run a, an, an update agent inside or anything like that. I just I come back to my Docker file, change a simple line, and then rebuild. If a developer has made a change to the My Website code, fair enough. All we have to do is rerun this, this um, Docker file again. It will copy in the new version of My Site into the container image, and I now have a new one to distribute around. One of the core concepts of Docker and one of the core concepts of containerization is this layer in the stack called a container runtime. In that previous diagram, the Docker engine was the container runtime. Um, and the container runtime runs natively on your host, whether it's a Linux host or a Windows host. Um, as we kind of talked about, we're not packaging up the operating system. We're actually running the application natively on the operating system. Um, so 
Uh, we only really support the modern hosts there, so Linux, Windows, uh, primarily running on x86 or um, uh, things like ARM as well. Uh, the Docker engine's job is simple. It starts containers, it stops containers, and it gives you a bit of access to container logs and, and, and maybe a shell prompt in a container image. Um, it's not in the I.O. path. It's not doing any of the, the kind of communication between two containers or anything like that. That's all being done on the host. Um, the communication between the container and the kernel, all being done by the host, we're, we're not in the I.O. path. Uh, because that point, um, Linux containers have to run on a Linux host. Windows containers have to run on a Windows host. We're, we're not providing any kind of uh, uh, encapsulation or anything like that. So if you started a Windows application in a container on a Linux host, the first thing it's going to say is, well, where's the Windows kernel? Um, so, yep, uh, that, that's kind of one of the things. And then the other part, so the container runtime manages containers. It also handles images. The Docker engine's job is to pull images down from the internet or from a, a registry. Uh, it's to extract them, and it's to build new ones. When we get to the demonstration in a moment, um, you'll see that the Docker engine's job here uh, will be to, to build uh, container images. Cool. Let's quickly jump to a demonstration. OK, so I'm now uh, on my laptop. And on my laptop, I'm actually running um, a, a a product that Docker uh, announced in December called Docker Desktop Enterprise. There is a Docker Desktop Community Edition as well, but this is our enterprise version, which gives you centralized management and, and kind of a fully supported um, development environment. This bit of software now enables me to run containers locally on my Windows 10 machine. So uh, I've got Docker Desktop running. I have on my laptop a Docker file. So a Docker file, as we just talked about, clear text, pretty straightforward. I'm actually here, I'm going to start from Alpine uh, Lightweight Linux distribution, and I'm just going to copy application code from my laptop into that container file system. Really kind of uh, simple, kind of one of the, the more basic Docker files you'll see. Um, but it kind of shows the concept, right? We'll start from Alpine, and we'll copy our application inside. To turn that bit of clear text and my application, which is just sat here running in my directory, into a container image, we need to talk to the Docker engine. Pretty simple command, docker build. We're going to call it, um, I don't know, webinar demo version 1, and off we go. Now, that was actually using some cached content, so it was pretty quick. But all we've done there is we uh, open up the, the temporary file system, copied across our application code, and um, ready, ready to go. To start a container, pretty straightforward again. So Docker container run. Um, I'm actually going to expose the firewall of a container so I can access it from my laptop. It's kind of like a, a software firewall between each container. I want to punch a hole in it so that I can access the container's web server. And uh, webinar, webinar demo one. Cool. Great. So the container image you've just seen me built have now gone, OK, I want you to start it as a container. The container runtime, in this case the Docker engine, please take the container image you just saw me build and run it on my laptop. So it's a web server. Browse to the web server port. Perfect. There we go. You can now see that I have a pretty simple web server. Uh, this one actually just displaying cat gifs because you know it's the internet. Um, running locally on my laptop. I'm now a developer. I've containerized my application. I run it locally. Okay. The next question, I guess, is all right. I developer. I package up my application. I run it locally. A quick smoke test. It works. How do I now distribute? my container out to the to the world. Pretty simple. So I'm going to rename my container image from uh, webinar one um, to uh, a, a, a container registry. Uh, that's the name of my container registry. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to take the container image that I've just built on my machine and send that container image off to a 
off to a centralized store. If a developer containerizes an application locally, well, that's great, but how does he get that to the data center? How does he get that to a public cloud? The distribution mechanism around containers involves registries. Um, and here you've seen I've just taken the container image and pushed it upwards. A quick look inside of a container registry now. Quick refresh. We can now can see a tag one got pushed there um, 20 seconds ago, and it's 20 meg in size. Imagine trying to distribute a virtual machine like that, right? You have to take like an ISO or a VMDK or something and, and trying to get that around. A container image is so lightweight that we can just push it around. And I've not had to, to worry about anything. Um, just to kind of prove, well, what happens now, if, if I uh, jump onto a second server, in this case, uh, a jump box server running, uh, running in the cloud, and try and start the same container, uh, Um, you can see the first thing it's done is it said, well, I'm unable to find that container image locally. It doesn't exist in my jump box. I've just built it on my laptop. So it's gone out to the uh, to my registry. It's gone out to here and said, I'm going to download this. It's downloaded it. It's extracted it. And it started it for us. Now hitting the same port on my jump box. Bingo, there we go. I can see um, I, I have uh, the web server running there. It was that quick and easy to take an application, containerize it locally, test that it runs, push it to a shared store, and now run it on a second server. That's the kind of the power of abstracting your application away from its infrastructure. And on that second server, you didn't see me installing anything. You didn't see me installing the web server, installing Java, installing Python, it's like it, it was all inside of the container image. Okay. Um, so that kind of moves me on to the next question. Well, what happens if I have multiple containers and multiple uh, hosts? Running one container on one server is great. Like that, that, that's wonderful. However, realistically, in my enterprise, I've got. I don't know, 200, 500, 1,000 applications, and I have a, a fleet of, of, of virtual machines. How do I start to manage containers or schedule containers at a higher up level? Um, and this is the world now of a container orchestrator. Um, just to make sure we're all clear, some, some popular container orchestrators include things like Docker Swarm, uh, include things like Kubernetes, uh, they're probably the two closest, as, uh, two thirds ahead as market leaders. But there are a few more out there in the industry. A container orchestrator's job is now to sit above all of these container runtimes, so all of these Docker engines and all of these uh, virtual machines, and start to schedule containers across them all. If a new developer comes online and says, "Hey, I, I want to run my web server somewhere," um, he will now talk to the container orchestrator and say, hey, I want to run one instance of my cat demo. He doesn't have to know if there's free resources available on the environment. The container orchestrator's first job will be, well, this one's got 10 containers, this one's got 10 containers, that one's got nine. Oh, great, I found some room. I'm going to schedule the cat, server, uh, cat web server uh, over here. Perfect. That's kind of the first job of a container orchestrator. It now provides a scheduling across multiple Docker engines. It also handles resource management. So when we start to allocate resources to containers, and, and you can do, you can say this web, uh, this web server needs so much memory and so much CPU, all of that can be taken into account when scheduling. Even, for example, if you had things like uh, schedule this workload on a server with encrypted disks and GPU inside, that as well could be, could be included in kind of the scheduling decision. You no longer now have to worry about where your applications run. You just tell the orchestrator to do it, and it will it will find somewhere to run your application. The orchestrator also comes with a self-healing element. They actually are now starting to move to uh, distributed systems. Orchestrators are declarative, and they start to run control loops. 
And what I mean by that is, if you say, hey, Mr. Orchestrator, I would like to run one web server, um, it will deploy it on your environment, and then it will keep checking back in to make sure that web server is running. It will jump back, jump, check back in and say, hey, is that web server still running, yes or no? If it's not running for whatever reason, it will reschedule it. And then finally, an orchestrator has an idea of service management. Someone needs to keep track of where all these applications are running, where all these containers are deployed. The days of someone having to manually update a spreadsheet every time a new application is deployed goes away because the container orchestrator now keeps track of where the application is running and how to get traffic to it. A lot of people now want to start to build on top of a container orchestrator. And when you start to bring container orchestrators into your into your enterprise, into your companies, there's often more tools people will need, need to actually start to operate containers. Primarily, people at this point will bring in a management layer, and they would bring in a container registry. Um, and we start to call this now a container as a service platform, where we start to bring all the required tools in to operate a container runtime, a container orchestrator, inside of your environment. Um, and that's exactly what the Docker Enterprise container platform is. So if you ever see the concept of Docker Enterprise as part of this series or as part of any of the other material that, that Docker produced, um, this is our container as a service platform. Um, it can run on any infrastructure, whether that's physical, virtual, on-premise, off-premise, uh, we honestly don't mind can run Linux workloads or Windows workloads. Absolutely, we honestly don't mind. Um, we bring in our container runtime, and now this is a hardened, secured version of our container runtime, our, our enterprise distribution, if you will. Uh, we bring in two supported orchestrators. We bring in Docker Swarm mode, and we bring in Kubernetes, the open source community project. Um, so if you wanted to schedule your containers via either one, not a problem, Docker Enterprise manages both of those orchestrators and provides um, access to the APIs for you. And then finally on the top, we bring in a control plane and a registry. Uh, the control plane, uh, the control plane provides this now management user interface on top, right? Containers are pretty CLI driven and pretty kind of like, uh, it's quite a bit of a learning curve to understand how to deploy containers and, and manage them. The control plane now provides a central point for you to, to really deploy containers, grab the logs, grab the metrics, um, and manage your applications. We now provide like basically a cluster management functionality on top of the orchestrator. The control plane is the place in the stack that manages Kubernetes and manages Docker Swarm. And it can also provide sort of enterprise features like role-based access control, uh, centralized logging, and centralized monitoring. Uh, the Docker Trusted Registry um, is that, that, that enterprise container registry that you saw me use inside of my demonstration. When I wanted to get my application from my laptop to a, a VM running in the cloud, I needed a central artifact store. The Docker Trusted Registry is that central artifact store, and we build on top of it with enterprise features, like scanning images for vulnerabilities, uh, signing images to, to kind of say who's built them and who's seen them. So really kind of locking down um, what developers, uh, what container images developers can use. And we can also provide things like uh, re image replication and mirroring. So if you if you had, know, had two sites, you would push your images to one registry, and we'd take care of replicating them and mirroring them off to a second registry. So you can start to see here that these are kind of enterprise features built on top of container orchestrators, container runtimes, um, on top of your underlying infrastructure. Uh, the, the enterprise container platform is just one part of the wider, I guess, Docker, uh, I guess, product um, vision. And you can start to see here the end-to-end -end journey from a developer running on his desktop using the desktop enterprise product that you, you saw me uh, use to build my container image locally, distribute the container image through the Docker Trusted Registry, and in a moment you can see me deploy it onto the universe control plane. A true end-to-end -end journey from a developer developing an application to an operator running the application in production. 
Um, and as, as we kind of talked about, the three core pillars of our platform, choice, security, and agility. The next webinars in this series will be dedicated to each one of these pillars, so we'll dive deeper into choice and have a look at any application, any infrastructure uh, uh, aspect of running containers. We'll have a look at security in terms of locking down container images. And then in the, in the fourth web webinar, we'll have a look at agility and try to understand how our containers can speed up application deployment and application patching. Uh, if you guys weren't aware, but there's obviously some analysts out there in the industry. Forrester recently released a report to say how, what's the enterprise container platform market looks like. And as you can see here, Docker in, in the top right hand corner is a strong leader in this space, providing a secure way to run containers uh, in the enterprise. Cool. Now, just before I finish, um, I just wanted to have a quick demonstration of showing what what an application deployed by a container orchestrator would look like. Um, just one final demonstration. So you saw my um, my cat web server. If I wanted now to deploy this on to multiple servers and deploy this at, uh, across our environment, we need to deploy it on a container orchestrator. Um, at this point, I'm going to actually define my application as something called a service. Now, a service provides um, this abstraction. I'm now telling the container orchestrator, I would like two instances of my web server. Go away and, and deploy them. This is the universal control plane. This is the management control plane as part of the Docker Enterprise. And if I jump in here and say, I would like to deploy a new stack, a new application, a webinar demonstration, put it on Kubernetes and just deploy my application. So the container image you just saw me build, expose it on this internet, uh, on this port, and I would like two copies. That That is the simple instruction we're telling the orchestrator. Kubernetes, go and find a place to run two containers uh, uh, using this image. Off you go. I, I don't care where they run. You schedule them wherever is best, wherever available resources, and off we go. A quick check now, and, and hopefully a couple of seconds, we should see uh, this deploying. A couple of seconds. Um, cool. Good. Um, yep, we're now starting to see, oh, actually, we've got an error. OK, I'll have to go and look at that one in a second. But yeah, we can now start to see how, how Kubernetes has taken my application, it's taken my deployment artifact, and it's deployed it cluster-wide. I no longer have to worry about managing individual containers on individual hosts. I can manage it centrally via a control plane. Cool. Well, that's it from, from my side, that's it from the content. I wanted to kind of give you guys a, a, an overview of, of what containers are, some common use cases of containers. Look at exactly what a container runtime is. Look at exactly what a container orchestrator is. And then introduce you to the Docker Enterprise Container Platform. As we go forward now in this webinar series, we will cover each of those pillars in more detail. Then deep dive onto Kubernetes. And then finally look at modernizing traditional applications um, inside of, of, of Docker Enterprise. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm now going to work my way through uh, the questions in the chat. Um, thank you. A quick check now, and, and hopefully a couple of seconds, we should see uh, this deploying. A couple of seconds. Um, cool. Good. Um, yep, we're now starting to see. Oh, actually, we've got an error. OK, I'll have to go and look at that one in a second. But yeah, we can now start to see how, how Kubernetes has taken my application. It's taken my deployment artifact, 
and it's deployed it cluster wide. I no longer have to worry about managing individual containers on individual hosts. I can manage it centrally via a control plane. Cool. Well, that's it from, from my side. That's it from the, the content. I wanted to kind of give you guys a, a, an overview of, of what containers are, some common use cases of containers. Look at exactly what a container runtime is. Look at exactly what a container orchestrator is and then introduce you to the Docker Enterprise Container Platform. As we go forward now in this webinar series, we will cover each of those pillars in more detail, then deep dive onto Kubernetes, and then finally look at modernizing traditional applications um, inside of, of, of Docker Enterprise. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm now going to work my way through uh, the questions in the chat. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay, we will now open things up for Q&A. We do have our Docker expert online here, Robert Freeman, to take those questions. Robert? Thanks. Um, so there's, I, I've been kind of answering as we as we went, um, but, you know, with, with a thousand folks, we, we've had a lot of questions. So uh, I'm going to kind of hit um, a couple things that, are, that haven't been addressed yet, uh, as well as some things that I've seen a, a lot of questions about. Um, you know, the first one is, uh, Windows and Linux, you know, can you run containers, uh, run a Linux container on Windows or, or vice versa? Um, so you, you cannot natively run uh, a Linux container on Windows or a Windows container on Linux. Since they're sharing the kernel, uh, they need a, a, a compatible kernel to be able to uh, be able to run that app. So if you wanted to run a Windows app, you need to be able to expose to a Windows kernel. Um, the one question that I got sort of related to this was uh, what commonly referred to as LCALs or Linux in our Windows. That is something that Windows has demonstrated a couple times. Uh, they made available in beta, and that uses their uh, Hyper-V hypervisor uh, to create a really lightweight uh, VM, uh, and then put it a so lightweight Linux VM, and then put a Linux container in it. So it is it is containers sort of since there is a container, but there's some overhead with the uh, with the Hyper-V um, uh, VM that, that it's sitting on. Uh, so while you can do that, it is not supported by Windows yet, uh, by Microsoft yet. Uh, we'll see whether whether that comes out. You know, it's it's been a, around for quite a while, and, and there hasn't been a ton of progress on it. But, so you would need to run the uh, you know Linux Linux hosts that are running your Linux workloads and Windows hosts that are running your uh, Windows workloads. Now you can uh, join this together uh, via Swarm or so Docker Swarm, uh, and be able to run say SQL Server uh, data. Base running on a Windows box with a you know a Tomcat uh, job app running on your Linux box, uh, and that would uh, be networked across the uh, uh, that that Docker uh, Swarm um, components. Now uh, there was another question in regards to Kubernetes and whether you can build uh, whether Kubernetes OS agnostic, uh, whether you can build a Kubernetes cluster across Windows and Linux. Uh, not right now. So Windows is based on the the most recent versions of Kubernetes, uh, it, Windows is not in, Windows support for Kubernetes is not in GA. Uh, that's something the Kubernetes community is working hard on. We are working hard on it. Um, so as soon as that goes into GA, you'll see that in the Docker products, the ability to support Kubernetes workloads on Windows. But right now, it's not there yet. So I would you know look for that in the next uh, probably this calendar year toward the end of this calendar year. Uh, so right now, if you want to run workloads across, the orchestrator would have to be Swarm. Um, if you're running only the Windows workloads, then you can go ahead and use, uh, or only Linux workloads, and you can go ahead and use <laughs> Kubernetes uh, only. I have a question about, is Kubernetes uh, installed on Docker by default? The answer is yes. Uh, when you stand up a Swarm um, or a cluster uh, with Docker, uh, it automatically creates uh, also a uh, Kubernetes cluster and a Swarm. Form, and both components run on all of the uh, various hosts uh, and, and provide you access to that. And you can either dictate, I only want to use this orchestrator, or I only want to use that orchestrator, or you can let them use either. Just something to be aware of on that is because they are not aware of each other, uh, any resource constraints that are established uh, you know, can be crossed. As you could say, hey, there's eight cores here, so I'm going to give this app five uh, via Kubernetes, I'm going to give this other app five via Swarm, uh, and then you know there's only eight to go around, but they're trying to address ten, so uh, that'll, that'll create a uh, conflict and a, a performance issue. Um, the other question I, I got is that there will be 
Um, where does Compose come in? Uh, Compose is uh, kind of a set of uh, specs or parameters that allow you to communicate with the orchestrator, whether that be Swarm or Kubernetes, uh, and allow you to kind of dictate the configuration or the state once the app. So uh, the Docker file is to one uh, container as the Compose is to the app. So if you have, it'll you know stand up your your database and your your web front end and maybe your RESTful API and you can configure that all in the post file, how they're networked together, how they're exposed, what labels and constraints you want to put them either from a resource perspective. Um, that is how you uh, use Compose and that's how it kind of fits in the, uh, the medium. If you've ever used uh, YAML, uh, Kubernetes YAML file, uh, it, is, it is sort of a more human readable version uh, of that. Uh, it looks like we're kind of running out of time. Uh, there is a recording that will be sent out in the next 48 hours. I uh, appreciate you guys coming on, um, and uh, hope to see you on uh, some of the other webinars here coming up in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. This does conclude Pomeroy, who is a technical solutions engineer here at Docker. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can enter them into the questions panel, and one of our Docker experts will respond. We will also take questions at the end of the webinar. Please know this session is being recorded, and you will receive a copy via email in about 48 hours. That's the key items I wanted to cover. I am now going to hand it over to Oliver. Infrastructure and application choice um, with Docker Enterprise. First off, I kind of want to start as a little bit of a recap on, on, on where we, we, we came off in the last episode. And just to make sure that everyone's uh, understood and, and what we're talking about here when we talk about an application container. Um, an application container uh, is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application uh, all bundled up into an artifact. That artifact does not contain the host operating system. It does not contain a kernel. Uh, it does not contain a networking stack. All of those components are shared um, from the underlying host. Um, but an application container is just your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run that application. So for example, it could be um, your web server as the application code, sorry, your web content as the application code. And then the binaries and libraries could be, I don't know, IIS from, from Microsoft with a .NET framework underneath. Or it could be your Java application code with the binaries and libraries being your JVM. That is, is what we're packaging up. That is what an application container does. And one of the key things and one of the key themes throughout this webinar as we go forward is once we package up your application as a container, you now achieve uh, portability. Um, one of the, the key, I guess, visions or, or, or uh, yeah, kind of goals or north stars for, for Docker as ourselves um, is any application, any operating system running on any infrastructure. Um, whether you're packaging up traditional applications, microservices applications, uh, packaging up uh, software from ISVs, doing big data workloads, blockchain workloads, or, or even going all out to serverless, all of those things can start to run in containers and can start to run on the Docker platform. Whether you're a, a developer developing applications locally as part of your um, development lifecycle, you, you want to package them up into containers, or whether you're an, an operator who, who just wants to, to streamline his operations, automate more of his application provisioning, um, they can all take advantage of containers. The Docker platform then is the layer that will separate your applications from their infrastructure. That provides us the portability that we'll talk through as we go through this webinar. And today the Docker platform can run in the cloud, public or private, can run as virtual machines in your data centers, uh, can run on physical servers, as bare metal. And we're also starting to see more and more use cases of the Docker platform starting to be used on edge and IoT devices as well. Once applications are packaged up as container images, 
they really can be deployed and run anywhere the Docker platform can run. Uh, last time in the last series, uh, last episode, we introduced the three core pillars of, of, of Docker's platform: choice, agility, and security. Uh, today, we're going into that choice pillar. That that is what we're, we're we're going into today, and we'll spend around the next forty minutes or thirty-five minutes now looking into the choice that the, the Docker Enterprise Container Platform brings um, when when starting to containerize your applications and deploy your containerized workloads. Um, we will look at agility and security uh, further on in, in the series. So the three core pillars of Docker Enterprise, what, what's, what, what's behind the titles? Um, so let, let's look at choice. And this comes out with any application uh, can be containerized. We, we, we don't want to, to have an opinionated view that says um, you can containerize any application as long as it's framework X or you can containerize any application as long as it's been developed in the past um, 12 months. That's, that's not the ethos of Docker. We're really helping you containerize um, new applications, cloud service applications, microservice applications, as well as traditional enterprise applications. We're seeing a, a huge interest in, 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 in people working with Docker, taking their existing applications today, containerizing them, and then getting the benefits of, of portability, agility, and infrastructure savings. So as part of the Docker Enterprise Platform, we provide that choice. We don't we, we provide the choice of what applications you can you can containerize. Um, we also provide the choice on the infrastructure side. Whether you're working on premise, off premise, in the cloud or on the edge, we really don't want to, to lock you down and say, well, you can run containers, but you can only run containers on this one operating system. Or you can run containers, but you can only run containers on this one uh, uh, one piece of hardware. Uh, that's not us, and that's not one of the ethoses of, of Docker Enterprise, and we'll talk a bit more about that today. Um, we're also working hard to avoid locking, whether that's through standardizing things like the container image format, standardizing the distribution of container images, um, or, or standardizing the actual runtime for containers, uh, we're really working hard to, to, to kind of provide confidence that once your applications become containerized, we're not, we're not forcing you down a certain path. So um, in the last episode, we, we looked at some of the common use cases of Docker Enterprise, everything from modernizing traditional applications to modernizing your software supply chain. Um, and in this particular uh, episode, we're going to look uh, quite closely at, at these two. How Docker Enterprise enables you uh, to, uh, or, or complements your cloud strategy as it helps you migrate applications to the cloud. And it also helps you avoid lock-in once you get to the cloud. Um, we all know today that, that each, each cloud vendor is working hard with, with, with cloud native services to keep you on their platform. One of the great things around containers is it provides that agnostic layer. So once an application is containerized, it really can move between different environments and different clouds. So we'll talk a bit more about that uh, today. Um, and we'll also look at how we can help you reduce uh, data center and expenses. Um, there's there's a, a key business case and, and, a, and a strong TCO when you start to look at containers and you start to look at containers in the Docker Enterprise platform. Um, when we start to go from the model of having one application deployed per server, and then we move to the container world of having more than one application deployed per server, we can start to reduce our virtual machine footprint, we can start to reduce our operating system license spend, and we really can start to drive up the utilization of our assets. So we'll look at that today as well as part of choice. Um, so today, um, the Docker ecosystem, it really is one platform, one tool set for all, uh, all environments. 
Um, and hopefully you'll see this when we start to go through some of the demonstrations. That, but you can run Docker today natively on your laptops. You can containerize your applications natively on a Windows or a, a Mac. And we can even run Docker on a Linux laptop as well. Um, so you can really can containerize applications locally. Um, once applications are containerized, uh, we can then start to run on Linux machines. And, and Linux containers have been uh, around there now for quite a while. Um, we can run on Windows machines. We, we have Windows containers, and we've been working with Windows containers in Microsoft now since 2016. Um, we've done a bit of work in running containers on mainframe. Uh, I will caveat and say that's, that's Linux on mainframe, but um, we absolutely can start to run mission-critical workloads um, uh, on sort of IBM Z and IBM P series as uh, containers uh, and, and on top of the Linux operating system. And then we really do have deep integrations and deep ties with all of the major public cloud providers. I've only put three on the slide here, but I know that you can run containers in a lot more than that. Um, and, and the idea here is that once the application is containerized, it can maybe be containerized on the laptop, you can then move between the platforms at ease. We're not locking you down into, well, containers will only work on Linux, or containers will only work on Linux on Amazon, or, or anything like that. The, the, the idea here is that Docker um, provides that agnostic layer between your applications and its infrastructure uh, so you can migrate between all. Um, and, and absolutely, we, we, we believe containers can enable a hybrid cloud model. Uh, seamlessly move between on and off premise. Um, this could, um, as we talked about, the, a container image contains everything your application requires to run. So it's your application code and the binaries and libraries required. Therefore, there'll be no dependencies um, uh, really on the infrastructure for your application. We need a modern OS and we need a modern kernel, but in terms of the prerequisites for the application, um, they should all be bundled up inside of the container image. So therefore, if you wanted to move that application container from private cloud to public cloud, for example, um, everything required to start that application, to run that application, uh, should be living inside of the container image. Uh, therefore, you're not having to, to ship around all these different pre-compiled artifacts depending on environments. You're not having to create run books that are environment specific or anything like that. Um, once, once you containerize that application, it is then agnostic of the, of the underlying infrastructure. You can even go to the point, and, and we'll show it in a demonstration shortly, where you can containerize that application locally, and a developer containerize an application locally on his on his desktop, um, migrate the application to, to one cloud, work with it there. If he, if he wants to roll that out, he can move it then to a second cloud. Completely agnostic to the infrastructure, completely agnostic to um, any of the, the, the um, uh, cloud provider APIs or anything like that. We are, we are truly avoiding lock-in with containers. Um, back to a previous point that I mentioned that w we don't need to now start to write run books that are environment specific. Uh, application definition um, can be written in clear text. It can be written in uh, common frameworks and common languages such as Docker Compose. Um, and these describe how your container will run. Um, and we'll jump into that in a bit more detail, but then you start to have a, a, a container image which has all your application and binary code, and then you have one clear text file which define how your application starts. And that's the only thing you need now to move your applications between environments, the application code and its, and its definition file. Um, so what is application definition? Um, here I'm going to talk a lot about Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a, uh, as a, as a standard or an open source project that we've been working on now for a number of years here at Docker. Uh, and, and Docker Compo Compose is, a, is a, basically a clear text YAML file that can live alongside your applications in source control. So it's a, a single file. You store it inside of your, your um, uh, next to your application binaries. It lives in source control, so therefore it goes into full release management. And inside of it, you just define out all of your um, applications. 
And, and what I mean by that is an application is often made up of multiple containerized services. For example, on the left-hand side here, you can see that there is a, a service that is a database, and you can see that there's a second service that is a web tier. Now, in one definition file, I have clearly uh, listed out that my, 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 my application is made up of two services, a database and a web tier, and then I can start to define some runtime characteristics. When an application starts, use this particular container image. When the application starts, um, expose it uh, or open up a hole in the virtual firewall on port 8000 or whatever it may be. And so as well as packaging up my application as a container image, I can write a really simple definition of how the container images will interact, how the services will interact. And once again, this is all now infrastructure agnostic. That one Docker Compose file will tell me how to deploy my application, no matter which environment it's running on. It's, it's not saying, if on uh, Amazon, use uh, this, this API. If on Azure, use that API. Because Docker has abstracted us away, um, that one Compose file will deploy your application, no matter what infrastructure it's, it's set up. Once you've written your application definition files, you can then just use one command, one line, to start all of your dependencies. Something like Docker Compose Up will bring up the full uh, application. So let's jump into a demo, and hopefully that uh, we can start to start to see this um, in action. So I'm just going to jump um, quickly to uh, um, a terminal session, and then we'll jump into um, Docker Enterprise. So um, we'll start here um, with one of the, uh, the famous demo application that we looked at in the last episode, and that was um, a, 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 a website I've developed to show uh, GIFs of cats. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, inside of my current directory, you will see that I have my application code. So you can see that I've got a, a Go binary and I've got some, some files. And then I have two very critical files. I have a, a Docker file, which defines, uh, as we talked about last time, how to build a container image. And we have a Docker Compose file, which talks about how to run my application, no matter what infrastructure it's running it. Um, so the first thing I will do uh, to kind of prove full, I guess, mobility, uh, I'm going to run the application locally. Uh, for this, uh, I'm going to use Docker uh, Desktop Enterprise. Um, so Docker Desktop Enterprise is, is, a, is a product that enables you to run containers locally um, on your local machine. So I'm just running here a Windows 10 machine. Um, I want to start to containerize some Linux applications. Docker Desktop Enterprise provides me a, an environment to work with Linux containers or Windows containers locally on my machine. So, um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to containerize my application. Pretty simple. Uh, Docker build, give it a name, uh, webinar demo, and off it goes. Great. So, what I've just done now is I've turned my um, my, my application as it is into a container image. I can run my application locally pretty easily. So Docker container run. Um, I run it in detached mode and uh, open up a virtual firewall port so I can have a quick look inside. But webinar demo. Great. So I now have um, my my, my application running locally. A quick um, quick jump in a web browser to localhost on 8080. There we go. I now have my, the famous uh, web server. Great. So containerize an application. It is now infrastructure agnostic. It is now ready to be moved to the cloud. Um, I don't want to have to ship around that command. That, that Docker container run command, there's, there's variables in there. I, I don't want people having to remember that. that. That needs to now start to live in a text file. That needs to come uh, live in source control. And um, we do that through Docker Compose. So if I now have a look at the Docker Compose file, um, you can see uh, I have two components to my application. 
or I will have two components. I will have the, the web tier that you just demonstrated, and I'll have a database for us to store some of the content. Now, in a compose file, I've, I've clearly listed out the two applications. I've also then listed out some things about those applications. So this is the port that it was required to run. I, I don't have to write that down in a run book. I don't have to write that down in um, kind of any uh, installation instructions. It lives alongside your application in source control. Uh, I've even listed out things to say how many replicas to run and, 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 how, and things like that. So if I was to take the containerized application you just saw me, me, me containerize, and I'm going to push it up to a container registry. Now, a container registry is how we distribute images. It's the it's the the, the kind of the, the artifact store in the middle. Um, so I'll just take my uh, container image called Webinar Demo and rename it. Just going to rename it to my registry. Uh, And now I want to push it. So what I've just done is I've taken an application that I have locally. I've containerized it. I've run it to say it, it works. It's great. And now I've pushed it up so it can be ran anywhere. Uh, a quick look inside of our container registry um, should show us that we have a, a cat demo image pushed 20 seconds ago. Excellent. Good. I now have the container image off my development machine into my artifact store ready to go through um, a level of delivery process. Then the question will be, well, how do I tell um, my environment in Amazon or how do I tell my environment in, in AWS, uh, in Azure or how do I tell my environment in VMware how to run this application? I have the application containerized. But, but how do I tell them how to run it? Um, and the answer was simple. It was that Docker Compose file. So if we take that Docker Compose file in, in its content as it is and copy it across, I can now drop this inside of any Docker Enterprise environment and it will start up the application. So um, go to a, a new stack, create the stack. Uh, webinar demo, I want it to be on Swarm, I want to use Compose files, and there we go. It's that simple for me to take an application, uh, define it, and then run it. Now I can take that same Compose file and put it into any Docker Enterprise and, and it will start up this application. Oh, there we go. Created successfully, done. Um, so I now have two services running for my application. Um, it's exposed publicly. Um, so if I go to the, 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 the a web port now on the internet, so a, a completely different URL, um, there we go, I can get to my application. So containerized it locally, write, wrote, a, wrote a compose file to say how to start it, and then moved it from my laptop to a cloud, or moved it from one cloud to a second cloud, or moved it from on-premise to the cloud. Like there, there is no, there, there is nothing that I had to do on my on my Amazon infrastructure there to tell it how to run the application. In terms of, I didn't have to uh, SSH onto a machine. I didn't have to install any binaries. I didn't have to uh, say web server coming in, um, uh, install nginx or anything like that. It was it was all all hosted inside of that container image. Okay. Um, so kind of moving uh, through and, and along. So a Docker enterprise we talked about is, is absolutely platform and infrastructure agnostic. Um, we, we work absolutely fine on premise, off premise. Uh, we support all of the major public clouds as well as all the major um, private clouds and, and on premise uh, solutions. But at the same time, we are multi-operating system and multi-Linux um, support as well. We provide choice at every layer. And, and what I mean by that is you can build out this stack on any Linux distribution that you'd like. 
we don't want to sit there and say you have to use uh, I don't know an enterprise Linux distribution. You can use an open source variant. You can use a um, an enterprise variant. You can absolutely mix and match to say what what you want to build on. At the same time, if you wanted to run Linux containers and Windows containers, absolutely fine. We've supported Windows containers now since 2016, and we can absolutely run Linux and Windows in the same environment, in the same cluster, in any cloud. It really does provide you with, 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 with choice. Um, we even have support today for hybrid environments and hybrid clusters. Let's say you're working on an application that has, um, uh, I don't know, a, a, a Java or a Tomcat front end running on Linux, and you have a SQL Server back end containerized running on Windows. You want to containerize both components. You want to put both components inside of container images and you want to define the application as a compose file, even though they are completely different operating systems, this can be done today, ran on the same environment and ran today on, on Docker Enterprise. Um, maybe you're in a situation where you're starting to migrate parts of your microservices across from, from one operating system to another. Maybe today you have a Windows application, a microservice Windows application that you're starting to migrate components to, across the .NET Core. And you could do something like every time you, you, you migrated a component across the .NET Core, the rest of the application is still running on Windows, and you can now have a, a completely mixed environment where you have new components in .NET Core on Linux and old components on .NET Framework on Windows. Um, you absolutely can start to run mix and match environments. As part of Docker Enterprise, um, we deploy uh, overlay networks for containers to communicate. And we can actually create overlay networks that bridge Linux and Windows containers. So when those Linux and Windows containers communicate with each other, they'll actually run um, across that, that overlay network, agnostic of the underlay. So therefore, all of the kind of networking complexity of multi-operating system, multi-platform gets taken away. It's all a, a kind of Ag uh, agnostic or, or, or abstracted away from you, a bit like an application container is. And Docker Enterprise today is the only platform that supports Windows containers in production, and it's the only platform that supports Windows and Linux containers uh, in the same cluster. So, um, one of the other common questions and one of the other uh, great things about choice that we, we, we provide as part of Docker Enterprise is we honestly don't mind which container orchestrator you use. Um, if today you have a, an application team developing an application in Docker Swarm and you have a, a second application team developing an application in Kubernetes, um, we honestly don't mind which uh, uh, orchestrator you run across our cluster. Docker Enterprise supports them both. As part of Docker Enterprise, you get a fully supported Swarm and fully supported Kubernetes distribution. Um, both orchestrators are deployed at installation time. Both of them are managed via our management tools. And so then the question becomes, um, as an, as a, an application team is uh, developing an application, it's their choice, depending on the feature set of the of the container orchestrator, which one they use. Um, let's say they are are doing an awful lot of work on Windows and Windows containers, um, then Swarm may be the orchestrator of choice for that application team, because today Docker Swarm has had quite mature and, and, and production level support for Windows containers for a number of years. Whereas, let's say the second application team is doing an awful lot of work with uh, I don't know, a single RAN containers, basically cron jobs in containers, um, and that may be driving them or, or steering them towards Kubernetes. Absolutely, then fine, no problem. We will have both orchestrators running inside of our environments, and it is absolutely up to the um, application team which one they use.
Docker is also working on ways to start to abstract away the um, orchestrator from the application team. And we're doing this through application definition. Uh, we talked before about how a Docker Compose file can be used to define how an application can run. And that the same Docker Compose file defines how an application can run on any environment. Well, today, um, we've actually done an awful lot of work to make Docker Compose agnostic of the orchestrator as well. So you write your application definition once. And then all applications, whether they are Windows or Linux, Kubernetes and Swarm, can be defined the same way using the same clear text YAML, can all live in source control. And then as part of, um, the, uh, as part of Docker Enterprise, we can choose whether that application is going to run on, uh, on, on Swarm or it's going to run on Kubernetes. We're not locking you in in any way. We're not uh, kind of forcing you down one path. If you wanted to, to start out on an application team, wanted to start out on Kubernetes and then migrate to Swarm in, in a future release or, or vice versa, they don't have to change how they can pack, package their applications. They don't have to change how they define their applications. Um, Docker Compose abstracts both away from you. All of this technology here is open source. Um, we, we, this was a, a big announcement for us at our last DockerCon in December, um, that you can run Docker Compose today on top of any Kubernetes environment. Um, there's a, a link in the slides here to find out more about it. And, and if you wanted to start to run Docker Compose across your uh, other Kubernetes environments, you absolutely can do. And it's all we re re here to provide choices in write your application once and, and, and kind of abstract yourself away from the orchestrator, from the operating system, and from the platform. OK, so let's have a look at uh, some demonstrations of this. Jump back to um, my command line, and we'll go to uh, demo two. Um, so in here, I have a pretty simple um, Docker Compose file. Um, this Docker Compose file uh, is made up of three, three services in one application. It's made up of a database tier. It's made up of um, an API tier. And it's made up of a web tier. Um, Three container images that I've already pre-packaged and I've already stored on my registry. Um, inside of here, you can see some things around the number of instances of the API server I want to run, and things about well, what 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 port in the firewall do I want to open up? That's my application definition, and and, and if I just take a, a quick copy and paste of that, um, I can drop it back into. My, my universal control plane for Docker Enterprise. So um, go to a new application stack. I'm going to create my stack. Now, uh, here I'm going to show you how we are orchestrator agnostic. First thing I'm going to do is, is, is say I um, uh, give it a name. So we're going to call this uh, Compose Demo. It's going to go on Swarm this time. And um, paste that in there. OK, so first thing I've done, taken my application definition, deployed it on Docker Enterprise as a Swarm service. I, I, I now should have three complete tiers of my application all brought up and, and working. So quick look at the Compose demonstration, look at services. There we go. We now have three successful services uh, brought up in my environment. Um, you can see that there is uh, one web tier, one database tier, and the five API layers. I can even go one level further and click on that and, and find out um, underneath what the underlying containers are doing. You can see they're all sat down here. And you can do things like um, have a look at, at logs and, and get prompts into them. But once again, I've not had to install anything on my environment. Docker Compose has abstracted everything away. A uh, quick refresh of the firewall, a uh, quick refresh, sorry, of a web page. Now gets to see a, a, a word generator. Every time I refresh the page, new words come in. That's what the API was doing. This was the application. Um, 
as you can see, it was written for the, the, the December conference. I've, I've borrowed Sauna's application. Okay, but let's say this is going okay, but um, the application team have, have, read, have read some blog posts, uh, a, a, new, uh, a new Scrum Master has come in and said they want to port this application across to Kubernetes. Fair enough, like, no problem, the application is containerized. Um, so we'll go back uh, here to Docker Enterprise. We're going to go back to our stacks. Going to create a stack. Call this one uh, Compose Demo 2. This time, uh, pick Kubernetes rather than Swarm. Uh, specify which namespace. And drop in the same Compose file. That same application definition. I haven't changed anything. It, it, it still got the free tiers. It's still got the same images. It's still got the same number of replicas. It still has the same firewall port. Uh, create this application. Um, now I have a new stack. Click on it. And you can start to see we're now using different terminology. Instead of using services, you've got this concept of controllers. and We, we have this concept of pods. Quick look inside of here, you can see that we now have a deployments and replica sets. These, these are our, our Kubernetes objects. But that same application definition file has, has, has understood what I was asking and, and has translated that into to Kubernetes objects. So you can see here that I have one database, I have one web, I have five uh, APIs uh, containers. A quick refresh of the Kubernetes um, web page. There we go. There's our application again, running on a, on a slightly different um, uh, uh, port on the way in, just to avoid a conflict. But the, the idea here is that I've not had to change anything. I've defined my, I've containerized my application once through Docker. I have defined my application once through Docker Compose. And then I'm able to work agnostic um, of, uh, of its environment. Okay, so um, that, that's how we can use Compose to uh, abstract the orchestrator. Well, how can we use um, Compose here to abstract away the operating systems? Um, I'm going to change clusters. I'm going to swap to um, this one over here. And what's special about this environment is that it's a hybrid environment. If I have a look at the underlying nodes here, you can see that I have a mix of Linux and I have a mix of Windows. I have all of those uh, different container hosts inside of my environment. Uh, I even went a little bit crazy and I started putting different versions of Windows in here. So you can see there's some 2019, there's some 2016. Maybe not go that far, it's, it's kind of personal choice. Um, but the idea is we, we can actually support all these various different types. We are not locking you into, into to anything. But what happens if I wanted to deploy an application that had some Linux containers and some Windows containers? For that, I'm going to jump across um, to the final uh, final demonstration, demonstration number three. Um, and in here, I have uh, a, a hybrid application. Now, it's it's once again, I have services, I have a few different tiers, so I have a database tier at the top, I have a .NET API tier in the middle, and I have a Java web app tier at the bottom. Great, okay, free tiered application. But what's, what's interesting here is that I have some constraints. I say this application is Linux, so start it on a Linux node. The middle one, the .NET API layer, is Windows, so start that on a Windows node, and more in particular, start it on a Windows node of a particular version. We, we know that I have different Windows environments running here. I want to make sure it starts on the right one. Um, and then finally, on the, on the uh, web server side, start that one on Linux as well. You can see everything else is still defined. So I've still defined my firewall ports, I've still defined my network, I've still defined my volumes. Um, all of this is uh, agnostic of the environment. So if I want the final thing I will do is, is take this. Maybe a bit wider. Take that and drop it into my hybrid environment. Quick jump on stacks, create the stack, hybrid. 
Um, this one's going to be Swarm, Kubernetes, uh, Swarm, uh, Compose File, and paste it in. Great. So now I've got an application that spans Linux and Windows that's going to use um, container images that I've pre-built and pushed to a registry. It's going to use overlay networking to abstract away all of the container-to-container -container communication. So the Linux workloads can talk to the uh, Windows workloads and, and vice versa. Um, uh, all kind of agnostic of, of, of what the environment looks like uh, underneath. OK, uh, so it's just working its way through now, creating the networks for me and creating the services. Uh, great, done. Quick look at the hybrid environment. OK, and now we'll start to see that the Linux containers have come up green straight away. Uh, the Windows one takes a minute or two, and unfortunately, the Windows containers are a little bit larger. Um, um, but now you can start to see how everything is just agnostic, right? I, I'm completely uh, abstracted away from of what the, the platform and the operating system looks like. And therefore, all applications can be packaged the same way in a Docker container. All applications can be defined the same way in, in application definition files. Um, and they can all be automated the same way. Today, I've deployed all my applications via the user interface. But this could be done via a pipeline. This can be done via an API scripting job or anything like that. Um, OK, so um, give that one a minute or two to come up. And hopefully, if I, I refresh the, the web page, we may start to get somewhere. Oh, great, it's starting to come up. This one's a, a simple sign-up application. You put your details into the sign-up page, and it stores it in the database. Pretty pretty simple. Um, but yeah, so just to test it all works, quick sign-up. Uh, demo. Demo person, a couple of days old, and demo at test.com. Cool, so now we're just testing everything works. What I've just done there is I've signed up, I've put data entry in, it should have gone through the Windows API layer, the cross overlay networking, and then it should store that data in the server, in the database in the back end. Um, to test that it all works, to test that I'm now getting multi operating system. Uh, applications. Hopefully, the data should work in the back end and I should be able to log in. Uh, this would be the test. Great. Done. Okay, that, that, that now starts to show uh, a whole hybrid or a uh, hybrid environment inside of our, inside of our uh, clusters. Okay. Um, Uh, uh, one thing, uh, or one of the, the common questions that come up um, when we start to talk about Docker Enterprise and we start to talk, talk about deploying Docker Enterprise um, is how do we deploy, or, or is there an automated and repeatable way to deploy Docker Enterprise in all of these uh, environments? Being completely platform agnostic is great, however, I don't want to learn, or I, I need a quicker way to get Docker Enterprise installed on Amazon, on Azure, and on VMware at exactly the same time. I don't, I don't want to go away and learn the various different um, automation tools for each provider. And as part of something we call Docker Certified, or Docker Certified Infrastructure, rather, sorry, um, we've created a whole set of reference architectures automation tools and starting to integrate our platform into the ecosystem um, as, as part of a, a wrap around our platform. So with Docker Certified Infrastructure, with DCI, you, we, you'll find reference architectures on how to deploy Docker Enterprise in all of those different environments. You'll provide automation tools. The automation tools are, are um, Ansible and um, Terraform based. And, and it kind of provides a way for you to simply write DCI cluster uh, up, and that will start a, a brand new cluster on whichever environment you specified. So you could uh, say, I want to do a new cluster on Amazon, DCI cluster up, and it will bring up a full new Docker Enterprise environment on 
the underlying hardware. Then once the Docker enterprise environment's up, we've just shown how easy it is to move the applications between the different environments and how to, to define those applications in definition files. Um, a Docker certified infrastructure has been uh, available now for around about 18 months, and we're going through a few different revisions. Um, and all of this is, is, is kind of providing different ways uh, to release, install um, a Docker enterprise to our best practices. Um, we're also working closely with the ecosystem. So let's say you wanted to integrate Docker enterprise with your favorite logging or monitoring tool. Um, we provide an awful lot of choice at that layer too. We are, as we are using native Docker and native Kubernetes APIs, we're not locking you into any particular ecosystem tool. Um, so as part of as part of DCI, we want to stand that up as, as well. Um, okay, I just got a couple more slides to finish, and then I will uh, jump through um, some questions. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that data, reducing data center expenses piece, more or less the the business case or the high level content when adopting containers. Um, one of the biggest drivers for people to adopt containers, as well as providing choice on platform, move to the cloud, uh, et cetera, is to reduce the amount of infrastructure in your environment. Uh, today we run, uh, or traditionally run, one application per virtual machine. Um, when you start to move to containers and Docker, you can now start to run multiple applications per virtual machine. This now starts to provide huge uh, infrastructure savings, kind of reducing the server footprint, reducing the operating system spend, and sort of reducing the patch time. Um, we have uh, over 700 enterprise customers today using Docker Enterprise, and, and a quick survey from one of them uh, started to put numbers behind that theory. If I started to containerize applications, can the infrastructure savings itself um, kind of pay for all this new innovation that we're, that we're bringing in. Um, and so you can start to see here that if you started with 500 applications, and this was one of the financial services companies on the, on the East Coast of America, when they started to containerize applications, their virtual machine footprint dropped dramatically. You can see here that it kind of dropped from the sort of 5,000 virtual machines down to into the 1,000 of virtual machines. Um, number of cores have dropped. They, they actually have started to deploy a bigger virtual machines, so the number of cores is quite not relational to the number of uh, virtual machines, but uh, you can see that there's a huge saving there, and the utilization of those boxes um, goes up dramatically as well. So when you start to adopt Docker Enterprise, when you start to adop adopt containers, not only are you getting that agility and choice, um, you're also reducing that the infrastructure spent whether that's virtual machine count, operating system license cost, patching cost, or driving up server utilization. Um, this is all part of the wider uh, Docker Enterprise platform. Today, we, we had a look at desktop enterprise to containerize our applications locally. Uh, we had a look at universal control plane as a way to deploy those applications in Amazon and Azure. Uh, and we use the Docker Trusted Registry as a centralized point to push the container image from the developer uh, to an artifact store and then to the operator's clusters. We're working hard at making sure that there is a consistent look and feel across this workflow and, and helping, application, uh, helping developers or application teams move applications quicker from developing them locally through to running in production agnostic of any environment. Um, this platform is starting to get industry recognized. We, we, the first Forrester uh, wave came out in, in, in Q4 for container platforms, and we came out as a, as a strong market leader in this space. That idea of taking the applications straight from the developer through the artifact store and out to um, production clusters is a key unique of, of the Docker Enterprise proposition. And, and the final plug from myself, uh, starting out on just a quick recap, just to make sure everybody's um, starting out on the, on the same page here. Um, just a quite quick reminder, 
uh, containers are not virtual machines. Uh, they are different. If you try and treat a virtual machine as right, try and treat a container like a virtual machine, you're not going to get too far. A container is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application in a, in a package, in a unit that can be distributed around and started on a modern host. Uh, the idea being that you can start to run multiple applications in their isolated environments on the same operating system. Uh, reducing the amount of infrastructure required to run your applications and providing a really lightweight packaging format to distribute your applications uh, between hosts. You can run containers on physical servers, you can run containers on virtual machines, you can run containers on cloud instances, or you can absolutely mix and match as this diagram shows. One of the key concepts around Docker and the Docker Enterprise Platform, um, is that we're talking here about uh, any application running on any operating system on any infrastructure. One of the key visions for Docker and, and, and the Docker ecosystem, whether you are a developer, whether you're an operator, whether you're working with traditional applications, microservice applications, more modern things around blockchains or serverless, no matter what you're working on, containers can abstract you from the underlying operating system and the underlying, underlying infrastructure. And there are three core principles that we build into all of our products here at Docker. They are choice, agility, and security. Uh, throughout the webinar series, we're actually working our way through those three, killers, uh, three pillars, the last one being choice, this one being security, and next, in two weeks' time, we'll, we'll have a look at agility. Um, inside of each uh, pillar, there are a variety of different things inside of our products that, that enable that particular uh, vertical. In this one, we're, we're driving into security. So we're building, looking at how we've built in security at every layer of the containerized stack, how you can integrate security when developing software as integrated directly into your software supply chain, uh, we start to look at the chain of custody involved in sort of managing container images and then looking at how we start to apply governance and controls on container platforms when starting to run applications in containers uh, in production. Uh, previously, we looked at the variety of different use cases involved for containers and for Docker Enterprise, um, whether that's modernizing traditional applications by lifting and shifting them into containers, whether that's using a container as part of your cloud strategy to move workloads from on-premise into the cloud and avoiding yourself being locked in once you get there, uh, whether that's starting to reduce your data center footprint or reduce your data center expenses as you can consolidate infrastructure with containers, uh, using containers to develop software and deliver software quicker, so to modernize that supply chain and start to apply security controls around it, or start to deploy software at the edge and how containers can help you deploy software at remote sites, even in more trusted ways. In this particular webinar, we're going to focus in on these two, um, two use cases around how through containerization we can secure the software supply chain and how through containerization we can secure software being delivered uh, out at the edge. Um, and one of the key things, one of the key pillars I want to get through throughout this, this, this talk is that there is security at every stage uh, with Docker Enterprise. Whether you're starting at the developer side or starting at the operator side, we're going to look at how you can secure development of containerized images, how we can look at securing the content and so sort of securing the container images through their transition from developers to operators, and look at how as an operator we can secure the applications running uh, in production through various controls built into our platform. So starting with securing software development. And actually, I, I wanted to take a couple of minutes here just to make sure that people are aware of some of the security controls around container images when developing applications into them. Um, there's a kind of a, a lot of myths out there today that containers are insecure or running applications in containers today is insecure. I wanted just to kind of cover off some of the core concepts around containerization which provide security by default that you get to take advantage of the second you run your application inside of a container image. 
So the first question, I guess, is, is, is often answered, uh, sorry, asked is what runs inside of a container? Now, we've run the first webinar in the series. We've covered this in a bit more detail. But a container or a container image is a layered root file system. All it is is a root file system um, packaged up and distributed around. We're not shipping core parts of an operating system like a kernel or a networking stack. Um, in reality, just the, the layers of a file system that make up your application. Look at this in a, a little bit more detail. Uh, kind of layer one may be, be the Ubuntu file system. Layer two, uh, you, you may start to run a, a, and patch that operating system. And as you can see, that they are clearly separate layers. And then maybe layer three, you install a package. In, in this example, Nginx. But you can start to see how every time, um, uh, every time a, a different function is called in this particular container image, we've broken that out into separate container layers. Now, one of the key concepts around container images and one of the key security benefits you get around container images is that those layers are read-only. When the container image starts and, and starts running on a, on a host and on an operating system, those original three layers that you saw me build up on, on this slide are locked and are read-only. Now, there is a read-write layer on the very top. And you could provide persistent storage to your application by mounting in existing volumes. Um, but the, the core concept of your application is running read-only. So what does that mean? Well, it means that every time you start your container image, it will start up exactly the same way. Because all of those read-only layers aren't changing from container 1 to container 2. If for whatever reason somebody compromises that container image, and you start to then worry about whether that container image has been compromised and can't start anywhere else. That's absolutely not true. Won't be the case because they are read-only. If one particular container got compromised and you killed it, removed it, threw it, uh, threw it away, the second you started up that container image again somewhere else, then a, a, a hacker or, or an attacker would have to find their way back into the container image. All of their previous exploits, all the previous changes they made to the file system would have been made in this temporary thin read white layer at the top here, which gets thrown away. All of your application code lives in these read-only layers, which will not change no matter what people are doing at the top. As well as that, on the question around are containers secure, um, as part of the core container runtime, the Docker engine, as part of the core um, concepts of what a container is, they are secure by default, and everything is opt-out. Uh, two core concepts around containers is something called a namespace, which lives low down inside of the operating system, and something called control, control groups. Now, a namespace isolates what a container can see. And what I mean by that is that if you're in the container file system, you won't be able to see things from the host unless they've been mounted in because they're in a completely separate namespace. This applies the same for the networking stack. This applies the same for things like users and user permissions. And control groups isolate what a container can use. So if you start up a container and say, you only get access to two gigs of memory, then, then that's all you'll have access to. Those are kind of core concepts of what a container is, a namespace and a control group. We then start to, to harden um, containers with some, some concepts low level in the operating system. Now, this is here on the Linux side on this slide, but concepts are, similar concepts apply on the Windows and the Windows container side as well. And on the Linux side, for example, we have this idea of capabilities, and that prevents what system calls a container can make. And so right out of the box, there is a, a white list of available system calls that a container can make. But the majority of one, all of the, I guess, malicious uh, system calls that a process can make have been disabled. So you could argue that the process is actually safer, or your application process is safer running in a container than out of the container, because we've actually locked down all of those, those system calls straight away. As well as that, we apply things like App Armor and SE Linux controls, depending on whether you're running on a Debian-based or a Red Hat-based operating system. And they can prevent what the container can actually do on the host file system. So if you are starting to mount things into container images, maybe 
for persistent data or persistent volumes, um, there is a whole new level of, of, of permissions around what a container can and can't access. The point of this slide here is really to emphasize that there are secure defaults enabled in containers that are there today running out of the box. You may not need to know exactly how they work or, or how to tune them. I trust the fact that they're there, they're hardened, and, and your application is safe running in a container image. So rolling back a little bit to how to start to develop containers securely, or how to create a secure environment to start to develop containers in. Um, at this point, I, I want to talk about a product that we have called Docker Desktop Enterprise. Now, developing containers locally as a developer um, can be done on, on a few different tools. Docker today have been making a product called Docker Desktop now for um, a couple of years, and that provides a, a place a developer on his local uh, laptop can start to create container images and then start to push them or share them with the wider teams or, or push them over to operations. However, there's been no real way to secure the development environment that the developers are working on until now. So Docker Desktop Enterprise provides a, a secure, safe environment for containers to be worked on locally on a Windows 10 or on a Mac, uh, Mac machine. If you are part of the operation side, you now have a, a, a way to roll out this software development environment locally. So um, on, on the left hand side here we can now show how Docker Desktop can be rolled out via a service desk uh, using mobile device management solutions, which is something never before seen in the container world. Um, right. And, and so sort of the uh, desktop products of old, you, you have to have admin privileges on the laptop, you'd have to double click an EXE to install the, um, a, a development environment. We now have a centralized place for uh, IT operations to roll out safely a software development environment for you to start to package up applications as container images. And at the same time, uh, we also have a, a way using Docker Desktop Enterprise for you to lock down that development environment. There are now controls that can be managed centrally, whether you're sort of limiting, I don't know, the, the proxies that a developer could use or the amount of resources that they can consume on their machines or even to the point of what container images they start to build on top of, um, IT operation teams can start to lock down um, the development environment to provide control. Not to restrict functionality, but to provide control around what applications or what container images uh, can be produced. Now, once um, a, a, a developer has packaged up their application as a container image. The next question becomes, well, well, how do you start to secure that content? How do I start to move that, that container image around an environment securely? And how do I start to, I guess, provide layers of, of, of uh, security on top of that, that, that artifact? Now, the first thing that we can do inside of Docker is that we can sign container images. Now, signing container images is the process of a publisher digitally signing using cryptographic keys who built that container image. So if you're a developer, for example, working um, on Docker Desktop Enterprise and you've built a container image, when you share that container image up to the centralized registry, you can sign it with your cryptographic key. You can say, hey, yes, uh, I've seen it and I've signed it. Um, this is all part of some technology that we have called Docker Content Trust. It um, comes in a few different ways, but it provides the ability to sign container images, provides the ability to store container images inside of a registry, and it provides the ability to verify those signatures when you actually want to start to use container images. We'll get on to more of the verify on the operation side, but now I want to focus a little bit on signing and storing. So, why is it so important to sign the container images that you produce? Well, a few different things. Uh, first of all, it ensures that there is freshness of the container image. And what I mean by that is that if for whatever reason 
a container image is invalid, maybe it's expired, maybe new versions have been rolled out and developers want to stop you using previous versions, you can actually um, expire or, or, or remove cryptographic keys from container images. Therefore, if, if an operator wants to start to deploy that application, it would come up with an error as part of the runtime verification to say the image or the, the signature attached to that image uh, has expired. Also, one of the key things around signing container images um, is it ensures that the content that you've uh, created or ensures the operations teams, rather, are using content created by the correct publishers. If you wanted to lock down what container images were deployed inside of your environment, or if you wanted to lock this down to a certain group of publishers, uh, this can all be achieved with, with signing. Stopping um, operations teams using container images from the internet, maybe, or from sources, publishers, users that they don't trust. You can now say that every container image running on my cluster has come from those two publishers that I, that I, that I trust. Um, the idea of storing, so, so the signing of container images is done by Docker Content Trust. And that can be done when you build a container image. So that can be done on Docker Desktop Enterprise. It could be done on sort of as part of your pipeline, your CI tooling, things like that. The second step in the process is actually storing the image signatures. Uh, we all know today that container images are stored in a registry. Um, and whether that registry is a public registry like the Docker Hub or a private registry uh, like the Docker Trusted Registry, um, we also need to have some bits on the side to actually start to store the cryptographic keys that have signed container images. As part of Docker, that store is Notary. Um, Notary is, is a project that's part of the CNCF. It's, it's a kind of a core security pillar inside of Docker Content Trust. And as part of our public registries in the Docker Hub or our private registries and Docker Trusted Registry, um, where every time you push an image with a signature, we will store the image in the registry side, and we will store the signing and the cryptographic keys in the notary server side. One of the second core concepts of, of securing content in container images not only signing it to verify where it's come from, but a, a second, uh, even uh, more important possibly, uh, concept is the idea to scan container images to make sure that what's inside of them is secure, is clean, is, is kind of ready to run uh, in production. As part of uh, the Docker Trusted Registry, we have the ability to scan container images for vulnerabilities. There is a scanning engine built inside of the product. So every time you push a image to the registry, it can be scanned for vulnerabilities. Um, the scanning engine here is not checking the code in terms of vulnerabilities in the, in the developer's code. Instead, at a binary level, we are going through the container image, seeing what libraries and binaries are included and scanning those for vulnerabilities. Uh, the way that kind of works, so a developer will push an image up to the registry, up to DTR. Uh, we will actually break down a container image um, into its individual layers. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about layers before as a, as a way that a, a, to construct a container image. And what we will do is we will inventory out all of the components. So for example, in layer number one, we've inventoried out this OpenSSL inside of that file system and this BusyBox inside of that file system. Uh, in layer number two, um, there was an Nginx package. And uh, layer number three, uh, there, there wasn't any new binaries and libraries. That was actually just a, a syntax as part of a Docker file. Once we have this inventory, we will then compare it against a local CV database. So every day inside of Docker Trusted Registry, we'll, we'll go out to the, the internet if it's an online environment or a, a, a vulnerability database can be uploaded manually in offline environments. And we will scan, uh, or sorry, compare this inventory 
against that vulnerability database. So for example, if we had a look for a database and said uh, OpenSSL version 2.1 has a, a vulnerability, we will flag that this container image is insecure. It has a vulnerability and it's up to you as an operator to decide if that's something you want to take forward into production or if you want to go back to developers and say, please go and patch your container images. Um, they contain vulnerability X, Y, and Z. All of these results are, are published in a report. Uh, so the report is available inside of the user interface or it can be uh, exported out via JSON or via a CSV format. So you can clearly list out all of the vulnerabilities associated with a container image. And then you can start to build automation around this. So a, a kind of a, a good concept may be that uh, if you are if you're working with a, a CI CD pipeline in, in this particular environment, Jenkins, but there are many different uh, automation tools that work with Docker Enterprise, uh, you could have a workflow that looks a little bit something like this. New code lands inside of source control, maybe lands inside of GitHub. Your pipeline tool knows that every time a new commit lands to build a container image. Um, when the container image has been built, push the image off to Docker Trusted Registry. At that point, Docker Trusted Registry will scan that image. So every time a new commits land, we've now got a new container image, we will scan that for vulnerabilities. At that point, you can say, well, um, if there are no vulnerabilities with the container image and you're happy to move it forward um, into the testing phase, um, then the registry can handle that level of automation and can then fire off maybe a notification to um, back to the pipeline to say, all right, we're now working with clean container images. I want you to carry on the rest of the testing process and, and rest of the software supply chain. Uh, in this environment, the, the registry will call back out to the pipeline and start running some QA on a container image. When all the QA has passed and succeeded, goes off to the security team for one final manual approval to push a container image into production. And this is the production part of the registry, maybe not production rollout, not the CD side, more of the, the CI side. And at the same time as the uh, security team uh, verifying the container image and, and manually um, moving it off to the production registry, they would be signing it. And so now inside of my, my registry at the end here, I have a container image that has that is completely clean of vulnerabilities, so I'm, I'm not worried that there will be compromised packages inside. And it contains the security team signature. Therefore, I now have a publisher I can trust being the security team, and I know that it contains no vulnerabilities. And at that point, I'm, I'm quite happy that the container content that I've produced is secure. We'll have more of integrating Docker Enterprise as part of the pipeline inside of the Agility webinar uh, in two weeks' time. So let's have a demonstration of some of the secured content uh, in action. So uh, jump out of the slides. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be using Docker Desktop Enterprise. So we talked about Docker Desktop Enterprise as a secure way to develop containers. You can see here on my laptop, I'm running um, the latest version of, of, of Docker Desktop Enterprise. And this has been rolled out to me by my operations team. A quick look in the settings menu of, of Docker Desktop Enterprise, you can start to see that some of the um, operations team have started to lock down things that I can customize inside of my development environment. For example, they don't want me to start moving around with proxies, maybe giving myself access to, to um, blacklisted registries or something like that. So they've actually locked down the ability to configure. They may have also gone in here and said, well, um, I don't want to start you um, maxing out your, your corporate machines. I'm going to lock down the amount of resources that you can dedicate to this. And there are many different things inside of here that, that I can start to lock down as um, an administrator. Maybe lock down the version of Kubernetes that someone could use, for example. 
So now that I have my development environment, and my development environment is, is sat here running locally on my Windows 10 laptop, I'm going to start creating container images and then pushing them forward uh, to the registry. So um, here uh, I have a terminal session. It's connected to my, my local um, Docker desktop enterprise environment. And I'm going to work with a, a demonstration app. It's a pretty simple a demonstration app. For, if you've seen the rest of uh, the series, you'll know it's the, the cat demonstration. And so what I'm going to do is I've been working on this locally. I'm now ready to build this as a container image, and I'm willing to, to share it. So we've seen it's done via a Docker build command. So I want to Docker build this. Call it cat demonstration. And uh, we'll give it a tag of number three. All right, that's just packaging up my application as it is in my local file system inside of a, a container image. A couple of minutes just to, to download all the prerequisites and, and build my container image. Great. It's now built. Now I want to, to, uh, to push it. I want to want to, to distribute my container image from my local environment up into my registry my private registry. But I want to do something slightly different than I've done in, in some of my previous demonstrations. I actually want to sign this container image as one that I've, I've built and that I'm happy with. Now, I'm going to do that with a, a new set of commands called Docker Trust. Docker Trust is, is a, a way for you to, to um, distribute cryptographic keys as part of the signing process. It's also a way for you to push um, signed container images. So here I'm going to do docker trust sign and put in the same container image that you just saw me build. So it's right now currently only lives locally. Cat demo version three. Now what this is going to do is it's going to take the container image that you just saw me build and you're going to see me push it out to my private repository the same way that you normally distribute container images. You push and pull them between various different machines. Uh, after it's finished pushing all of the various layers up to the registry, uh, it's going to then start to push the signing data associated with this image. Now, I've already set up the, the, the cryptographic keys. I've, I've taken the public key of my user, and I've stored it uh, in the notary server. And the private key of my user I've kept locally on my Windows 10 machine. And that private key is what I'm using now to sign the container image. Quick passphrase for my key. And there we go. So what has that actually done? If I now switch to my um, container registry, can refresh. Uh, OK. What you can see now inside of here is that I actually have um, some container images, one, two, and three. And three was actually just pushed up. Um, inside of it, you can see that I have, this thing, a signed uh, banner. That shows that inside of DTR that this was a signed container image. Um, I can even inspect this to actually see who has signed my container image. So if I have a quick look back in the CLI, I could do uh, Docker Trust Inspect. And just put a pretty flag to clear up the JSON. You can now um, see from the output of this, this command, you should be able to see all of the container image tags inside of my registry and who it is that signed them. So you can see number three was one that I just created and signed myself. And it was signed by admin. I'm, I'm using the admin keys here to, to, to sign that container image. You can actually sign a container image with multiple different people. So the signer could be the developer and the security team. Or it could be the developer, the security team, and uh, the pipeline. As well as signing container images and, and storing that signing data here inside of the registry, you also have noticed that there is a column here around vulnerabilities. I talked about before that one of the key concepts we have here is scanning container images of vulnerabilities. 
And if I look at this in more detail, you can see that what's what's happened is that we've uh, we've broken down the uh, container image into its layers. And we talked about the layers of a container image before. And each layer of a container image, we've inventoried out its components. So you can see that in the base layer of a container image, it has these various components. It's then taken those that inventory and compared it against a local CV database. And so the first thing it said is, well, the version of OpenSSL you've used, um, that's, that's got some vulnerabilities. Looking at it in more detail, it's got these three, four CVs. Um, and I can even click the CV, take myself off to um, the, the public, to the, the CV websites, to actually understand more about the CV, and if that's something that I want to accept inside of my container image. You may look at this and go, okay, it has a vulnerability. Um, however, that's something that I've patched in a higher up layer, or that's something that I'm willing to risk on. But you now have that information front of hand. Today, you don't really scan, I don't know, virtual machine file systems looking for the binary libraries that you've got lying around. But we're able to do that in the packaging format that is the container image. And then, of course, we can start to build automation around this. I talked before about how you may want to then, I don't know, promote container images to, to testing repositories or production repositories, depending on the scan results. At this point, maybe as part of your automation, you may say, OK, I'm, I think I'm going to send a notification now back to the developer to say, work back on your image patch the vulnerabilities, push it, go again. This, this image is not going to make it forward to the testing or to, to the production stages. OK. So moving on, so we looked at how to develop container images using Docker Desktop Enterprise. We also looked at how to securely distribute container images using Docker Trusted Registry. We're now going to look at how to actually secure container operations and how to secure um, your container clusters. So by default, inside of Docker Enterprise, we actually do an awful lot of work to secure the underlying container cluster. There are some things that, that we want to make sure that are enabled the second you provision an environment. Whether that's cryptographically identifying each node with a unique ID, or enabling a TLS between all node-to-node -node communications. So therefore, if, you, if anybody was trying to listen in between any of the infrastructure chatter in your nodes, they couldn't. It's all uh, TLS encrypted. Or whether we wanted to handle the certificates and the certificate rotations between all of the nodes inside of your Docker Enterprise environment which are key concepts in securing the underlying platform. They're all handled out of the box in Docker Enterprise. A lot of these concepts come from Docker Swarm, and we've talked about previously how we run both Docker Swarm and Kubernetes inside of your environment. And we actually leverage Docker Swarm to distribute and to provision and manage the lifecycle of Kubernetes. So all of these key security controls are enabled for both orchestrators. Actually securing Kubernetes inside of Docker Enterprise a lot more securely than is done in an upstream deployment today. As well as that, inside of Docker Enterprise, we spend an awful lot of time looking at the role-based access control and working out how to restrict who has access to your environment, the level of access they do have, and to what resources they have access to. This is done through three clear concepts. First one being user management. Docker Enterprise can be integrated back into Active Directory infrastructure, LDAP infrastructure, or SAML v2 environments. So if you wanted to manage the users and the team centrally, that can be done. So if you wanted to say, um, I want to have application team one access to the 
Docker Enterprise Environment and Operations Team One access to the um, a Docker Enterprise Environment. Well, that can all be handled today via the Active Directory environment. You don't have to worry about manually creating users and having stale users lying around as the Active Directory environment matures. You have fine-grained roles inside Docker Enterprise, and you can start to take some of the pre-built pre ones we have in the platform, or you can start to build your own roles to understand exactly what a user has access to. They could be roles like view only, they could be roles like um, they can get log information out, you can have roles like you can deploy. However you want to mix and match this, every API call in Docker, in Docker Swarm, and in Kubernetes is exposed in our platform, and you can choose what users have access to what API calls. And then finally, we can start to group resources. Now the grouping of resources is done in Docker Swarm by a concept called collections, and is done in Kubernetes via a concept of namespaces. And now we get to start to pair all of these things together. So we could take application team one as a, as a user group, we can give it the operator role, and we can give it to the resource set of only application team one's containers and pods. Therefore, you know exactly which users have what access to what group of resources. Stopping application team two users um, having access to application team one's containers. All enabled by default inside of Docker Enterprise. We can even start to secure the communication between containers, providing additional layers of network security above the underlay network. Whether that's network encryption on both Swarm and Kubernetes, or via network isolation powered by Calico, inside of Kubernetes, we can actually start to control what containers can talk to other containers, whether that is inside of the same namespace, or whether that's between namespaces. So you could say uh, container one can only talk to container two um, through uh, port 80, or you can say nothing from application team one can talk to application team two. I want to completely lock down all communication between those two resource sets. Now they are virtual namespaces, they're, they're not physically isolating hardware or physically isolating um, networks, kind of like using like a VLAN or anything like that. These are software controls applied at the overlay layer to stop things happening. So it's to stop to application team one's containers, talking to application team two, if there's any level of compromise or anything like that. Both, both uh, sorry, using our RBAC model, using the name facing concept, using the network isolation concepts, you're able actually to create a very secure, single, multi-tenant environment, allowing you to trust that application teams can work side by side using the same container platform, maybe using the same underlying infrastructure, but have faith that there is a security model inside of the platform to stop, um, to kind of to isolate each tenant. Now there may be reasons why you need to have multiple environments between, um, I don't know, pre-production and production, and dev and test and production that you want to have uh, air gaps clusters and, and that completely makes sense. But the security model here provides you to have multi-tenancy on a single cluster. And then finally, one of the other key concepts built in to Docker Enterprise is the runtime of all of that signature process I talked about in the content section. If you are an operator and you're starting to apply controls over what can run on your cluster, one of the key things that you want to understand is you want to lock down exactly which container images can start in your environment. And this can be done through Docker Content Trust. Inside of Docker Enterprise, through a simple um, tick box inside of the user interface, you can start to apply um, policies around which container images can run. So for example, on the left-hand side, somebody could try and run um, kubectl create, and straight away the response you get back is the image did not meet the signing policy. 
that's great from an operations perspective, locking down what runs on your environment. And this is all done through the signing and cryptographic key process you saw um, in the previous demonstration. So let's look at the, the runtime verification in action. Over here, I have my signed peer images. And now if I jump to um, Universal Control Point, you can now start to apply um, runtime signature verification restrictions. So a little bit timed out, so I'm just going to refresh it. A minute or two to come back around. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply image policy restrictions on the cluster, preventing exactly what container images can run inside of your environment. So jump to administrative settings. Minute or two to warm up. Jump down to Docker Content Trust. And here you can see a tip box. Run only signed images. I want to tick that. And then you can choose exactly what signed images to run. Whether that is run signed images that have any signature, or maybe run signed images that start to have particular team's signatures. So maybe that was run signatures from the QA team. So therefore, any container image can start in my environment as long as it contains a signature from this particular team. Uh, I'm just going to remove that. For this demonstration, we just want to, to show that runtime enforcement works. So I'll save that. Now I'm going to start a container on Docker Enterprise. To do that, we have the idea of, 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 of um, user certificates. We talked a little bit like that in previous sessions, but every single user inside of Docker Enterprise has a concept of a client bundle. A client bundle are certificates that are unique to a user to authenticate them against the environment. So if I jump to uh, command line, uh, just change uh, directory one second. Change to the admin user. I can see that I have the client bundle um, unzipped in this particular directory. Client bundle contains unique certificates as well as scripts to source um, the certificates to my local environment. So if I source the certificates, if I did a command like docker node list, I would no longer be talking to Docker Desktop Enterprise. Instead, I'll be talking to the Docker Enterprise cluster running inside of this, this, this environment. But I'm not having to do um, kind of all of the user management was handled by Docker Enterprise. Creating the user, distributing the keys, deciding what role that user has, in this case admin, and defining what resource set that user can see, in this case, um, most things. Now, if I want to start, start a container image, hopefully my image policy will prevent me. So if I did a Docker service create, okay, I'll give it a name, and I want to test this works. So I'm going to try and use an image available on the internet. I'm going to try and use the Nginx container image. There's nothing special about this container image. It's just one that is published on the Docker Hub. But it's one that does not contain a signature. I've not built it. I've not verified it. Straight away, it comes back. The image did not meet our signing policy. It hasn't got the relevant keys as part of it. So what happens if I try and start up um, the container image you saw me build earlier, cat demo free. We've already tested to make sure it's got the right keys against it. Perfect. We can now start to see that it's deployed. Because it contained cryptographic keys from a local user, it is able to be deployed on my cluster. As an operator, I can now stop developers deploying container images from the internet, and instead only deploying container images from my local registry, from a verified publisher. Even if I jump to the user interface, assuming it wakes up a little bit, 
So if they had a new tab, would that help? We should actually start to see that service is now running. And we're also able to do a little bit of a cross-check. And that cross-check is where the control plane is talking to the registry. This is done um, to actually start to provide a list of what services are running inside of my environment, as well as, as you can see, we can start to bring across what vulnerabilities are running inside of my environment. So demo two was the one I just started. And you can see here that there is actually vulnerabilities associated with that container image. We, the, the control plane has talked to the registry and has said, what do you know about the container image? Well, the first thing it knows is it's got a signature and the signature is passed. The second thing it knows is it's got a list of vulnerabilities. So if you ever, as, as you start to go forward and as images get rescanned every day when the new vulnerability database comes out, you can actually start to see if the container images you're running inside of your environment are still secure. And over time, you'd expect them uh, packages to contain vulnerabilities as you start to, uh, as you assume to start to patch container images as you go, as you go. Okay. So just to summarize here, we've been able, able to use the full breadth of the Docker Enterprise Container Platform in those demonstrations. We use Docker Desktop Enterprise to securely deploy a development environment for my, for my developers. I then used Docker Desktop Enterprise to create a container image, sign it, and push it off to Docker Trusted Registry. I've used Docker Trusted Registry to store my container images, as well as to store the cryptographic keys. And then finally, I've used the Universal Control Plane to run my container environment not only providing a secure place for my uh, users um, and my user management, I've also provided runtime verification that the signature that the developer used is good and, 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 and provides runtime enforcement on my environment. That end-to-end -end story has put us in the top right corner of the Forrester New Wave report. So feel free to, to click on that link and don't have a good read around um, Forrester's views on enterprise container platforms. And finally, if you want to see more information like this outside of the webinar series, which will continue in two weeks, uh, join us at the end of April in San Francisco for DocCon 2019. At which point, thank you. Thank you, Oliver. We will now open things up for Q&A. We have Shaker Gilbert, Docker Senior Solutions Engineer, on hand to take your questions. So if you haven't already, please post those to questions in the questions panel. Um, Shaker, do we have any questions coming in that you would like to share? Well, there's actually quite a few questions. Uh, some of them are around um, uh, Docker Desktop Enterprise. Uh, so I just want to kind of quickly touch on that. So Docker Desktop Enterprise is the tool that Ollie was um, talking about that allows developers to build their code and, and lock down the resources that they're using in order to interface with the Docker Enterprise platform. Uh, in order to um, set a lot of those defaults and um, enforcements for what users are allowed to, to use, the resources they're allowed to use, and, and how they interact with the Docker uh, Enterprise platform. They're going to use an admin.settings.json file that kind of ships along with the install package for your Docker Desktop Enterprise, and that can be modified and enforced at install time. That uh, helps lock down the ability to use those um, services. There's also a couple of questions really around Notary. So Notary is, is open source. If you want to go to um, Docker Hub, you can just do a search for Notary. You can pull down the, the um, Notary client and the Notary server. If all you want to do is sign and um, uh, push images, you could use those processes. It is part of uh, Docker Content Trust. It's part of the Docker Trusted Registry. Um, so there's no additional software that you need to, to plug into that. Um, you would use your regular Docker engine. You could use Docker trust commands, which simplify uh, the notary client commands and um, uh, sign those images. Multiple people can sign those images and uh, have those pushed uh, into DTR. Uh, you, you will need a notary server of some sort 
um, that's running in your in your registry, if you're not using Docker Content Trust or sorry, Docker Trusted Registry, you'll need some sort of notary server in order for your third-party registry to to uh, read that and to support it. So. Um, Got a lot of questions uh, around those, but I, I can open up the floor if there's any questions anybody has. And I, I guess I should say, do we open up the floor or do we just look for the questions? Um, actually, yeah, everyone, with a group this size, um, yeah. we'll just have to go through that questions panel. So um, if there's a couple, um, we have probably about another five minutes if there's a couple that you want to pick from uh, the questions panel that are pouring in now. Sure. Well, yeah, so one question, uh, you know, can Notary be installed as a container on uh, Docker EE and K8's clusters? Um, it, it doesn't have to, right? So Notary is part of Docker, um, Docker Trusted Registry. If you're getting Docker Enterprise, you already have Docker Trusted Registry, and you can sign images regardless of their orchestration methodology. So if you're deploying your images uh, via swarm mode, uh, those are still signable. And of course, uh, if you're deploying your images using Kubernetes, those images can still um, be signed. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, there's not necessarily, there, there's a question about w whether or not um, there's an image for a notary server. You can, uh, yes, you can just go down to the, um, I guess, go to Docker Hub, you can pull that down. Uh, let's see. Let's see at runtime uh, when containers talk to each other, how to verify their counterpart SSL or something like that. Um, I'm not quite clear, Jason, what that question is. If you want to um, kind of specify that a little bit further, I'd be happy to address it. Um, typically, when you have multiple images um, that you want to tie together, those images will be part of your service uh, or your deployment, depending on, again, which orchestrator you're using. Uh, and then service discovery will, will handle all of that. If you need to validate or verify the images um, uh, that need to communicate to each other, um, you could build that into the images model or secret, it needs to pass to the, the other application for it to, uh, to, to bind to. Uh, we have time for probably just about two and, uh, or three more. Yeah, sorry, I'm just scanning through here. Um, yeah, what are some areas Docker is looking to improve on security? Um, well, security has always been a really uh, a big part of what Docker is offering and uh, what, what our core focus has been on. We believe that uh, uh, a true end-to-end -end security really starts at Docker Desktop Enterprise, and that's why you, we're going to be talking a lot more about that uh, at DockerCon coming up as well. Um, but it, it's one thing to build an image and secure it as part of the package that you're pushing to DTR, but we need to also do some sort of signing and enforcement between end-to-end, -end, right? So if we can uh, focus on end-to-end -end security starting at the desktop and then do enforcement at production, we can build secure pipelines through the entire chain, and that's really what we're focusing on. Um, any vulnerabilities that are also detected within uh, the packages, uh, we, we try to get on those right away. I mean, there was recently a, a vulnerability in... Um, uh, container D, and within a couple of uh, couple of hours, we were addressing it right away. So we we really focus on uh, ensuring that our platform is protected, and definitely ensuring that our customers are protected. Um, so Docker Hub, uh, the images are that are usually signed on Docker Hub are really the images that are provided by the official sources uh, under private owner or private collections of Docker Hub, you can have signed images that are that are associated with your uh, private registry. Public registries um, don't have signing capabilities because there aren't any account uh, management layers. So we need the account management layers to enforce uh, signatures. Um, when CVEs are detected for a container image, uh, see the image may relate to read-only read, read layers. So CVEs, the, the databases that, that you're downloading into Docker Trusted Registry, it's scanning the image themselves. And all images are read-only until you deploy it as a container. 
So there's no, you know, as Ali was uh, saying, there's there's no um, read write layer on an image until that image is spun as a container. You can think of it as a um, a copy on write snapshot, right? If you're familiar with like how, how uh, virtualization technologies work, right? So uh, the image is one thing, and then you're creating a snapshot of it. So that now there's a read write layer on top of it, but CVEs are scanning all the read only layers, right? So all the actual image layers that are stored in your registry. Um, the database is updated every day. Um, it's an uh, automatic update into your DTR. If you're on a dark site, we have a lot of customers that are in a dark site or sites that are not connected to the internet. Uh, they can fetch those databases down daily as well. Uh, there was also a question on, on should you check uh, or how, what's the frequency of checking CVEs uh, against images that are already contained within DTR. Uh, and, and so what you would do is you could set an API call in your CIC pi pipeline, like Jenkins or whatever you're using, so that it runs this API call, let's say, every day, uh, and it will just do a check and scan. When it does a check, what it's doing is it's comparing the database uh, quickly through the manifest. It, it's checking the database based on the layers that are already uh, scanned. If a layer has been modified or if a, a later layer has been identified as uh, containing a package that will need to have another scan to it, we'll scan that layer. Now, one additional thing is if a layer is scanned in one package, every matching layer that's shared within that DTR will also be updated. So it's, it's a lot faster um, once the, you start you know, loading uh, your images into the environment. Uh, so for removing vulnerability, rebuild image is the option. I'm not really sure what that question is. Um, removing a vulnerability, rebuild image. Oh, let's see. Uh, and so Dr. Speaker, if you want to pick one more out, um, we're just about have two minutes left. We just want to pick out one more question. Okay. Um, that's about what we have time for. All right, let me look through here. Uh, well, so I think that uh, this is not really a security-focused question, but one that comes up quite often is is really around uh, you know Ali demonstrated a lot of the uh, a lot of the UI, and uh, as you start using the tool, I mean the UI is really good for um, uh, kind of checking over the health of the uh, uh, of your enterprise cluster. There's also a way to identify images at runtime in the UI. Um, that have been scanned, right? So I think that this is kind of critical for the ops teams. Um, when you load in the uh, UI, you'll be able to see all the images that have been pulled over and deployed in your enterprise and then what the vulnerabilities are uh, with those running images. Uh, so it gives you kind of an end-to-end -end view of what's running in your enterprise. So I, I think uh, for ops, uh, the UI is really good. Um, and get a lot of information out of it and a lot of metrics out of it. But as you start moving further into, you know, the dev teams and everything, uh, the UI is generally not where you're going to find yourself because you're going to be doing your pipeline work or you're going to be on the CLI, um, you know, piping in code related to uh, Docker Compose or Kubernetes YAML files. I think that's all we have time for, Melanie. Yeah, that that's... Yeah, we're at so the top of the hour now almost, so thank you very much, Shaker, and thank you everyone for all your questions um, and being so interactive. If we didn't get to your question, don't worry, we will do a follow-up blog. A recap, just in case you missed um, some of the earlier parts of the, the series. Um, so first thing, just to kind of clarify on what is a container. Well, a container is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application uh, all packaged up. Um, a container uh, can run on virtual machines, it can run on physical servers, uh, honestly don't mind. Um, containers share the underlying hosts kernel and networking stack. So inside of the, the container you would have, for example, your application code and maybe um, IIS, the, the web framework, or maybe your application code and OpenJDK. Whereas the underlying kernel and the underlying networking stack would be shared between multiple containers. Uh, the Docker engine is a, is a small lightweight layer that we install on our hosts and the Docker engine's job is to create and start and stop those containers.
Uh, today we support Linux containers absolutely fine and Windows containers absolutely fine. But one thing to bear in mind, as we're not packaging up the kernel and we're not emulating the operating system anywhere, a good rule of thumb is that Windows containers run on Windows hosts and Linux containers run on Linux hosts. The, the main goal here for Docker is, is really to be able to support any application across any operating system, across any infrastructure. Really uh, separating um, and abstracting the application from the environment in which it's running on. Uh, today we have uh, end users uh, using Docker for traditional applications, for modern microservice based applications, and now we're starting to see more and more customers taking advantage of Docker for, for more modern projects like blockchain or serverless. The Docker platform then sits in the middle, separating your application from the underlying infrastructure, whether your infrastructure is in a cloud environment, uh, in virtual machines, or on bare metal. We absolutely don't mind. Uh, we make sure that there are three core pillars inside of the Docker platform that kind of underpin the strategy and direction of, of everything we do. And those three pillars are choice, agility, and security. And if you've been following along with this series, you would have known that we've actually started to work our way through the, the second webinar was looking at choice in more detail, the third, security, and this fourth one on agility. Uh, just kind of looking at those in a little bit more detail to try and understand where uh, uh, kind of uh, some of the, the design goals we have for our platform. Uh, on the choice side, we really are focusing on any application, new application or legacy. We honestly don't mind. We want to provide a seamless experience no matter what you're, you're working on. And that comes the same on infrastructure. We're really trying to avoid, um, trying to prevent you guys being locked into a particular platform um, or architecture. We're, we're really providing an abstraction between your application and the OS. On the security side, we want to make sure that we embed as much security as default into the platform, uh, integrating security at every level from the container to the container orchestration to the management tools. And then from the agility perspective, where we'll focus on more today, we're looking at how we can reduce the time taken to roll out software or maybe reduce the time taken to, to patch new software how we can start to integrate and automate more and more and kind of integrate into existing tool chains and pipelines. And we're also looking at agility, how can we can reduce um, the overhead of, of getting started with containers and reduce the overhead um, that often uh, more and more applications, more and more microservices put on, on infrastructure. There are some common use cases for Docker Enterprise, and we're kind of going through these as we go through the series, whether that's looking at um, modernizing traditional applications by containerizing legacy or, or brownfield applications, whether that's using Docker Enterprise as part of a cloud strategy or reducing infrastructure expense, using Docker Enterprise to kind of speed up the deployment of applications or securing your software supply chain, or finally, using Docker Enterprise to help deploy and roll out software at the edge. In this particular webinar, the, the technology that we're, we'll be talking through today will, will help you really uh, deploy and roll out applications faster and really secure applications through the supply chain, integrating containers with your native, uh, with your existing or, or new and modern pipelines. So first off, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at agility for developers, and then later on in the webinar, we'll, we'll switch to agility on the operator side. Um, so just a, a quick look on, on, on kind of the landscape on, on the ecosystem today. We can see that the number of hosts out there today running containers or running the Docker engine are growing year on year. And um, even if you look at uh, Datadog as a, as a source of, of, of data for this, you can see that 20% of the hosts that they monitor are running the Docker engine, and that keeps growing. And then at the same time, on the right-hand side, you can see that on the number of hosts that they have, not only the number of hosts is growing, but the number of containers per host is constantly growing as well. So what that means is that there are more and more developers today developing applications in containers than ever before. And we in Docker need to make sure that we're, we're working hard to enable 
more and more developers make it easier for them to get started with containers and make it more and more seamless to integrate with their existing processes and tooling. But today, uh, if you are a developer in, 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 inside of, a, inside of a, um, an enterprise or inside of a large corpora corporation, there are kind of a few key pillars that Docker can help with. The first kind of fr friction or question we get from developers is they want to understand when getting started, how can they have access to a local development environment? How can they work on containers within their corporate firewalls or, in, or on their corporate machines or corporate laptops? What is the kind of what is the quickest and easiest way for them to get access to environment to work on containers? Uh, the next question that often comes up is, well, how do, how can we closely integrate with their existing tooling and processes? Developers today are often quite tied to their um, development environments, their IDEs. They're familiar with common DevOps toolings, maybe, for example, Git for source control and, and, and maybe things like Jenkins or DevOps on the pipeline side. How can when uh, uh, the switch happens to start to containerize applications in containers, how can we reduce the learning curve and seamlessly integrate with those tools? And then finally, one, one of the other big big points and questions that often get asked when, when developers start to look at Docker is how, how can they get started? How can they reduce what we'll kind of call the Docker learning curve? Uh, just on the screen there, there are two snippets of a, a Docker file, which defines a container image, and a Kubernetes manifest file, which defines what an application looks like. Those two objects are often very complex, and, and, and there's an awful lot of uh, specific reference guides that you have to follow and to understand how to develop a containerized application. One of the kind of key focuses for us in Docker is trying to work out how to simplify the processes so that if a Java developer or a .NET developer gets start, get started with containers, they don't have to spend the first week or two just sat there and studying all the various syntaxes and, and, and kind of uh, flags. We want to really reduce the overhead on getting started with containers. Really providing agility for, uh, for developers, getting them into containers sooner and quicker. And one of the biggest tools that we have to try and solve some of these challenges is a product that we recently announced in, in December in Barcelona, and that product was Docker Desktop Enterprise. Docker Desktop Enterprise is a local environment for working with containers. It runs locally on your machines, whether that's a Windows machine or a Mac. Uh, for developers, it provides a local environment which is really giving them choice. It's not locked into specific frameworks. We're not saying that they have to um, uh, use, I don't know, maybe Spring or, or, or a, maybe have to use Java. We really provide a, a whole range of all the things that can be containerized can work locally on their development environment. We're working hard to seamlessly integrate uh, Docker Desktop Enterprise with their existing workflow, their existing IDEs and pipelines. And we're trying to abstract containers away as much as we can to reduce the container expertise required. For operators, Docker Desktop Enterprise provides a local development environment that they can control. Operators can roll out Docker Desktop Enterprise using their MDM solutions, using things like, I don't know, System Center or something to roll out um, uh, Docker Desktop to all of their uh, corporate machines. And we're providing ways for, for operators to lock down uh, settings inside of their local development environment, maybe lock down the, the proxy settings, the networking settings, for example, for the developers. And we're also providing a way for operators to control updates and control versioning. So a bit more looking at well, what is Docker Desktop Enterprise and, and how can I use it for a, a local development environment? Well, firstly, it avoids, if you're a developer, the works on my machine problem. A developer can create a containerized application locally or work on a containerized application locally and know that when they want to publish that container image, all they have to do is, is push up the, the, the Docker file or push up the container image to the registry and everything required to run that application will be embedded inside of that, that container image. For developers, we're providing choice. Any language and any framework we're working hard to support in containers on top of Docker. Um, 
We can actually support both Windows and Linux containers uh, as part of Docker Desktop. You may say, well, earlier on, Ollie, you, you said that um, Windows containers require a Windows host and, and Linux containers require a Linux host. So how can I develop Linux containers on my corporate Windows machine? Well, we actually run a really lightweight virtual machine as part of Docker Desktop. Something we manage, we seamlessly handle the upgrade, the hardening, the patching of as part of, of Docker Desktop. And that's a really lightweight Linux virtual machine. And then we work really, really hard to seamlessly integrate the networking and the file system of the corporate desktop into that virtual machine. So for example, if you hit localhost on the, on the corporate desktop, you're actually hitting uh, the networking stack of, of the virtual machine. So we're really kind of providing a, a development environment for Linux applications on a, on a Windows desktop. If you're working with Windows containers and Windows applications, then it'll seamlessly integrate using the, the native Windows operating system that your environment's running on. For Mac OS, um, we provide that native Linux environment again through the virtual machine. Uh, however, today we, we don't package up a, a, a a Windows environment to develop Windows containers on a, on a Mac virtual machine, uh, on a Mac desktop. Docker Desktop Enterprise provides an environment to work with containers with a local Docker engine, as well as work with container orchestration with local environments for Docker Swarm, as well as a certified and managed Kubernetes distribution. If developers are, are being asked to, to work on Kubernetes applications or containerized applications that are going to be deployed in a Kubernetes environment, we now provide the easiest way to get up and running with, with Kubernetes locally. One simple tick box inside of the UI will start up a Kubernetes distribution on your corporate machine. So let's have a look at, at a quick demo. Um, so here I am on, on my corporate machine, and uh, I'm running um, Windows 10 here. As part of Windows 10, my administrators have pushed out to me a Docker Desktop Enterprise. You can see that it's running as a background task, just looking at the taskbar in the corner. A quick check. Um, this is, of course, um, running Docker Desktop Enterprise. One of the most requested things for a local development environment is where developers want to version match the version of Docker that they're running and developing on with the version of Docker or the version of Kubernetes that they're running in production inside of the data center. Going back to that, it works on my machine. Not only do they want to test their application in a container, but they want to test their application in a container on the same version of Docker and the same version of Kubernetes. One of the key things that we provide as part of desktop is the ability to select the version, and we release these things called version packs, where you can specify different versions of the engine and different versions of Kubernetes. Here you'll see that we're switching between um, Docker Enterprise 2.1 and, and 2.0, which are in actual fact um, is Kubernetes 1.11 and 1.8. Just with a tick of a button, I'm able to test against both environments. And you can see here that the administrator is actually locked down. You can see locked by the administrator where my admin has said, well, those are the two versions you get to work with. We haven't quite finished rolling out anything else yet. So, so that's, that's kind of a corporate environment for you to, for you to work in. Uh, inside of the settings menu, you'll see uh, ways to configure desktop and, and configure the local development environment, including the option here to enable Kubernetes. One simple tick box, I have a local development environment. But this particular session is all about developer uh, agility. So how, as a developer, can I get started with containers really, really quickly? I don't want to spend a few weeks learning syntaxes. I don't want to spend a few weeks learning CLI reference guides. What is the quickest way for me to start working on a containerized application? Um, and inside of Docker Desktop Enterprise, we provide an application designer, UI-driven or wizard-driven UI to create a containerized applications. So I'm a developer. Uh, I've just been given the task to work on a new free-tiered application. Um, and I, I want to, to, to choose um, a free tiered application, which is pretty standard inside of my enterprise. Um, it's a Linux application. And my, my application is going to include a, a, a Flask component. It's going to include a MySQL backend. And it's going to include a, a HTTP proxy at the front powered by Nginx. 
Of course, these templates are absolutely customizable. You may build templates that are suited to your environment. Um, these are just a few that we include out of the box. So developer turns up, doesn't know anything about a Docker file, doesn't know too much about what, what, what uh, the process is to containerize an application, but he just knows I need those three components. I want to spend um, a little time as possible getting a local development environment up and running. So click that in the wizard. If I had any preference around Python versions or um, MySQL versions, I can customize that, but let's leave those as default. Hit continue, name my application, uh, webinar demo, and assemble. You just see me there go a few clicks through a wizard, and I've got a containerized free tier application running locally on my corporate Windows 10 machine. Uh, if I run the application, hopefully we'll see all of the uh, logging filter through as it starts up the various components. It'll start up the proxy, uh, start up the, the Flask layer in the middle, and then start up the database. It kind of blows through. A quick test from myself to make sure that everything's working successfully. Um, if I open up a, a web browser, hit localhost, perfect. I can actually see the Flask element in my application producing Hello World. At that point, the developer is good to go. He's got his components. He's going to start working on his application. Uh, I'm going to quickly open up this in an IDE, so seamlessly integrate into um, VS Code here. And I'm now inside the, the, the um, source code for my application. Then look here on the left-hand side. You can see that there is the back-end application, a database, and a proxy. Once again, I haven't had to understand what a Docker file is. I haven't had to understand how to define how those free services interact. That's all been given to me by a simple wizard. Developer may now come in here and say, OK, well, instead of saying hello world, let's change it to hello webinar. To rebuild my application, jump back into my user interface and restart. At that point, we'll rebuild all the container images for you from the source code. Well, first off, we have to shut down. <laughs> then once everything's shut down, uh, we'll rebuild everything back up again using new versions of my source code. Um, and once all that's gone through, we should be able to hit uh, localhost again. And Flask should now say, hello, webinar. Perfect. So I've seamlessly now gone from having very little Docker knowledge or expertise to be able to work with a containerized application in my IDE just through a few clicks. Um, the next question that may be, well, well how, do I, how do I share what I've been working on? Well, um, maybe you, you want to now push your container images that you've been working on locally up to your shared enterprise registry. The way that you would do that, jump back into your IDE. Um, for this, I'm just going to have to do a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of an, a manual task. I'm just going to have to rename my container images to something, um, something that 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 points to my uh, container registry. Once I've pointed uh, my images to the container registry rather than to my um, local machine, I can rename them using uh, Docker Compose. And I can push them up to the registry. What I've just done there is I've taken the, the container images that were pushed out of my template. I've renamed them so that they point so that they can be pushed to a container registry. And I've I've just pushed them. So now if I switch to Docker Trusted Registry, which is where um, which we uh, have as a component of, of Docker Enterprise you will see 26 seconds ago a new container version was pushed up to the registry and it's automatically by default been scanned for vulnerabilities and there's more content on what was uh, actually scanned as part of a vulnerability scan um, inside of uh, the security webinar in, in, in um, section sorry in, in the previous webinar number three so what have, what have I just kind of done and kind of go through I mean, the, 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 the kind of reducing the friction and providing more agility for our developers? 
Well, I've given my developers a local development environment. I've given them a, something that I can control and control the rollout of via operator tools like um, MDM solutions for both Windows and for Mac. I've given them a local development environment for Docker as well as a local development environment for Kubernetes. Uh, I've shown integration with existing tools. So you saw me there editing the, the application code in Visual Studio. As well there, you actually saw everything in clear text. So if I wanted to, I could easily check that application then, then and there into source control so my application can straight to be versioned and we can have collaboration with the rest of the team. And you saw how I was able to reduce the Docker learning curve by providing, providing a wizard to abstract all of the complexities of a Docker file and of application definition from the developer. Okay, so next kind of question, how, how can we start to provide agility for the operators? So one of the most common questions I get asked as part of solution engineering in Docker is, is well, how, how do I integrate this into my pipeline? Or do containers complement? Or, or how, how does containers and pipelines kind of work together? They're a very, they're very big technology in the ecosystem right now. A lot of people are, are looking at both their container strategies, their DevOps strategies, and, and their pipeline strategies. And one thing I will say is they absolutely all, all go hand in hand. We often find that container strategies drive people's pipeline decisions. And one of the core things and one of the core principles we provide inside of Docker Enterprise is choice. And one of the things that we try really, really hard to do is work with as many of the existing and leading uh, pipeline tools as we can. On the screen here, I've included a few tools, but I, I really want to stress that there are a lot more tools out there today that we can work with. Um, these are just some of the logos that I, I, I've pulled together. And one of the key things here is as developers start to build containerized applications, automation through pipelines is often the way to take the application from source code, building it in a container, testing it, securing it, and rolling it out. We often find that as part of developing applications in containers, the pipeline provides the automation to take it from the local development environment that you just saw into, into production. Therefore, the whole, the whole kind of relating this back, what we're trying to do here is reduce the time taken to roll out new software, test new software, and roll out patch releases. So if we look at the containerized software supply chain, if you really kind of looked at it from like 10,000 feet and, and simplified it a little bit, um, pipelines really revolve around four, four key steps. Building, testing, securing, and, and I will stress that securing often happens across, but for, for simplicity's sake, I've kind of called it its own section, but we often do see security underpin everything. Um, and then deployment. So the question then becomes, how can containerization and how can Docker Enterprise complement each stage of the supply chain? Well, uh, let's start on the build side. As part of rolling out containers and part of Docker uh, using Docker Enterprise, what you're able to do is you're able to have a standardization in your building artifacts. The application, um, once it's built into a container image, will be able to go through the life cycle of its journey um, because everything in a container image, everything required to run that application is packaged up inside of the container image. At the same time, we'll end up on a standardization for all of your application types. If you're building your legacy applications and you're building your modern microservices, you could be able to use the same tools and the same processes because Docker abstracts the application from the infrastructure. As well as that, on the build layer, we're actually able to start to reduce complexity and reduce the infrastructure required to support a pipeline through containerizing build agents. And we'll look a bit more about that in, in the demo in a moment. Uh, next, moving into testing. Um, as part of the testing phase, 
uh, containerization can simplify testing by providing a, a consistent environment from dev all the way to production. You build a container image once and pass it along. You don't have to worry about compiling it for each environment and then having to deal with all of the uh, obscurities between the, the testing cluster and the pre-production cluster and the production cluster. The container image will be the same from end to end. Uh, container images provide built, uh, versioning out of the box. Image tags in a container provide a way, so once a container image is called version one, um, it is kind of has its version number built into its name. And containers by default enable, for, enable, enable seamless scale out, enabling parallel testing. On the security side, uh, containers have a, can provide a clear audit trail. And so inside of the registries, we can have clear audit trail around who's pushed and pulled images. And, in, and sh as shown in the security webinar, we've seen how container images can be signed to verify who's built them and verify the publisher. And container images can be scanned. And then on the deploy side, we can have a look at how a pipeline can trigger the role of an application. And we can have a look at how container orchestrators seamlessly have um, rollout mechanisms to handle new software updates and new patch releases. So I, I kind of want to switch there into the demonstration and kind of show how each of these steps can be simplified with containers and can be simplified with Docker Enterprise. So for this, uh, I'm going to use a, a very simple and uh, naughty demonstration application. Uh, this particular application is uh, called my demo app. It's a very, very simple HTML-based application uh, that just serves up a static web page. So let's kind of go back. How can I reduce the time taken to, to kind of roll out new releases of my application? And how can I automate the process as much as possible? I don't want to have manual steps um, in, in kind of the supply chain anymore. I want to automate this end to end. Uh, to provide automation for my application, I'm actually going to use Jenkins. And Jenkins will provide for us the, the automation engine to move my application from building to testing to deploying. Um, and then at the end of the day, I have a Docker Enterprise environment running uh, Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. And this will be the runtime for my application once it's been built, tested, and secured. So let's start out. I'm a developer. Uh, I'm using Docker Enterprise, and I'm building my application locally. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is, as a developer, and I'm, let me just uh, make some changes to my application. Um, let's make a few changes. Uh, I don't know. Oh, there's a quick typo there. Let's tidy that up. Hello. Welcome to Ollie's uh, webinar demo. Cool. So I'm a developer. I've worked on my application. I'm quite happy with it. How can I get this? into the pipeline, into supply chain as quick as possible without picking up the phone and phoning uh, all, the, all the, kind of the operators and, and, and kind of manually manually starting to, to work on this, this, this application. Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check my application source control. Uh, this is a demonstration, so I'm going to carelessly push it up to master, but we all know that we shouldn't be doing that. Um, Quick look inside of my application source uh, control. Yep, 14 seconds ago, there is a new version of my application. Great. So one of the key things now is we've looked at our pipeline. And we can see that automatically a build job has been started. The build job here is going to take my source code and it's going to create a container image for me. Uh, I have some customers that use pipelines to create container images. I have other customers that use um, pipelines and containers to create traditional artifacts, so maybe to create um, uh, their Java jars or maybe to, to kind of compile their applications. So we can, we can absolutely use containers to uh, build container images, or we can use containers to build standalone artifacts. One of the things that I want to talk about here is that 
uh, I actually don't have a whole fleet of infrastructure sat behind my pipelines. I haven't got five, ten virtual machines sat there as build slaves. One of the things that containers enable me to do from an infrastructure and agility benefit, they enable me to have on-demand build agents. You would have seen that a build agent got spun up to do the job. And then once the job's finished, the agent's going to disappear. A quick look in, in, in the control plane, and um, I'm going to quickly switch under Jenkins. It's all got a bit wrong. And have a look under pods. You can see that, uh, well, less than a minute ago, a brand new container was deployed via Jenkins, and that container's job was to build my application. I haven't had to ha I haven't had to have underutilized build agents sat around waiting, and I haven't had to have build agents sat around with every single uh, framework deployed on it because because there's no standardization across the, the development community. What, what I'm able to do here is have build agents that are deployed on demand and have build agents with only the tools required for the job. Each developer can manage their own environment. Okay. As part of my demonstration here, I've actually got my application pushed into the registry. It's gone through um, my pipeline. You can see two minutes ago, everything was pushed up to Docker Trusted Registry. It was scanned for vulnerabilities. Uh, we detected some critical vulnerabilities in, in BusyBox and, the, and a few other things. At that point, from an agility perspective, my pipeline is finished. We, as, as Docker and as part of my, my design of my pipeline, have said, if the application contains vulnerabilities, don't move it forward to testing, don't move it forward uh, to deployment, send a, we, uh, a webhook, send back feedback to the developer to say you have components in your application that you need to patch. So that's come back to my developer. I'm going to um, go now back to my application, and I'm going to start to customize it. What I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to quickly patch my application. That's your fact. Quickly patch is to change uh, the, the, the container image and maybe change its content real quick. And a quick push up to master. What I've what I've now done is I've restarted my supply chain. My previous supply chain failed because I had an insecure container. Um, now we've hopefully fixed that, and we'll start to see that the build job's going to go through uh, for me. And if I jump in here, we'll start to see that it's going to build a container image for me and push it up to uh, the registry. Fortunately, I'm working with quite a light environment, so it takes a few seconds to move it around. A quick look inside of the registry. We can see that automatically, um, that didn't go very well. Um, the container image was pushed up. That didn't go great. I'm going to go again. Huh. One second to see what happened. It looked like I uh, didn't quite take the new base image for me. Still showed some uh, vulnerabilities. Let's try again. Um, but what we should expect to see is a automated promotion take place. We've actually written some automation inside of our registry that says, if our container images are clean, move them up the chain. Move them from an in particular uh, developer's repository, and I've just happened to call my developer Dave the developer, but move, hit, move the, the container image from, from there into testing. That's kind of a, an automated step now between building and testing we haven't had to. Um, we haven't had to have any manual processes. Hopefully, the, the second go works quite well.
refresh. Oh, perfect. A uh, new image has landed, and it's just being scanned for vulnerabilities. Give it a minute or two to be inventoried, um, and it should move on. Perfect. So it's finished. It didn't contain any critical vulnerabilities. That's because it was a, a newer container, and it should have nicely moved across to a testing repository, seamlessly moving the image through its lifecycle. Now, testing repositories will have different sets of permissions. They'll have different automation attached to them. In my particular demonstration, I've said, if a new image starts in testing, land it in the testing job. Now, we all know there's various different types of testing, smoke testing, integration testing, UAT, et cetera. Um, all of that can be embedded inside of a pipeline for simplicity and really uh, to kind of reduce the time taken to run through a demonstration. Uh, I'm going to show how uh, just a simple smoke test. I'm going to deploy my application as a container. Um, once it's OK, I'm going I'm to leave it in a, an, an approval stage. If it's good, I'm going to move the container image to production. Now, one of the key things that I talked about on this slide is that there is a consistent artifact from end to end. I don't want to have to rebuild my container image every time it moves through the pipeline. One of the, and that's kind of what we have to do today, right? We have to uh, change our application depending on which environment it's working in. If it's working in testing, I have to build it for it. If it's working for pre-prod, I have to, to work it for it. Um, as part of a container image, you can build once and move between um, move between the different environments. Right, it's just about looking like uh, testing is coming to an end, and we can move to the, the deployment phase. Uh, this is where I've just put a very very manual gate in to accept that the container image is good. Hopefully, in your environments, you've got more <laughs> more more processes around this. But I'm just going to say, is it okay to deploy to production? Yes or no? Absolutely it is, and it's going to go away and um, finish the, the final two steps for me. What I expect to find is a production container repository that now contains all of my clean images, all of the ones that have been scanned for vulnerabilities and are OK. And I also expect to find all of my container images uh, have been properly version numbered uh, uh, and signed. Now. This now becomes a very clean artifact that I'm happy that's gone end to end through my software supply chain. There was one manual step, which was a, 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 a gate, a yes or no, but everything else has been automated end to end. Built once in a container and using Docker Enterprise, in this case, Docker Registry to, to provide my artifact store and to use Docker Enterprise as the underlying container platform, um, I've seamlessly moved my application from a, a developer's laptop right the way to production. There we go. 18 seconds ago, a clean container image. Now, when it comes to rolling out container applications, um, the good news for uh, operators is that container orchestrators, so Docker Swarm and Kubernetes, come with some really great features to help you roll out application changes. They can seamlessly handle rolling out groups or updating containers one by one so that the application itself has no downtime. There's a few different ways that you can, can roll out applications, whether you want to do them one by one, whether you want to do blue-green, whether you want to do canary builds. All of those things are now possible in containers. You're able to bring up the old and the new container side by side and then decide when you want to fill traffic over to the other side. And all of those features are built in by container orchestrators and uh, abstracted the application away from its infrastructure. Orchestrators like Swarm and Kubernetes can even handle the, the automatic rollback and, uh, of your application if something goes wrong. So kind of going through the kind of pictorially what, what my demonstration just showed, it showed new code landing and source control. It saw Jenkins building my container and uploading it to a registry. The testing phase happened where if it had no vulnerabilities, do some simple smoke tests. 
if the smoke tests pass, um, get security to sign them off, and to push the image into a production repository with no vulnerabilities and an audit trail of signature data. And then when the new production image lands, get the deployment processes to start. And in my case, Jenkins would have, would have detected that a new production image has landed, and it would have automatically a no downtime rollout to my Docker Enterprise cluster, showing both the CI and the CD side, showing how Docker Enterprise, Docker Universal Control Plane, and the Trusted Registry can, can automate uh, or be the backbone when, when rolling out new versions of software or rolling out software for the first time. Hopefully, through today's webinar, you've seen the various components of Docker Enterprise uh, in action, from providing agility to, to the developers with Docker Desktop Enterprise, providing a local environment to work on Swarm and Kubernetes uh, applications. We've shown how we've used the Docker Trusted Registry to publish the content that the developer creates. And then we've looked at how the Trusted Registry and the Control Plane can be used again to take away some of the pains from rolling out new versions of applications uh, through a pipeline. All the way using consistent application formats, using the same container images throughout, making sure that security has been at the heart of the process when rolling out applications into production on Universal Control Plane. Uh, if you've not seen, Forrester recently published a, a new wave on container platforms, and there's a link to that report here. Your applications away from your infrastructure, really with the mandate of any application running on any operating system, running on top of any infrastructure. Whether your application is a traditional application, a microservices-based application, or maybe some of the, the newer frameworks around sort of blockchain and serverless, uh, we're trying to abstract your applications away from where they run, whether that's running on-premise, off-premise, on physical servers, or even on the edge in IoT, um, that's the, the kind of the position of, of the Docker platform. Uh, we've also gone through in previous webinars the three key pillars of the Docker platform, providing choice on what application you want to run and where you want to run it, providing agility, making it quicker and easier to roll out new uh, software releases, and making sure security is integrated at every part of the platform. Um, also, in, in the first webinar in the series, we introduced the idea of a container as a service platform, a CAS. Uh, a CAS for us is a platform that's made up of multiple components to run containers in an enterprise. Uh, including things like enterprise container runtimes, uh, container orchestrators, as well as management tools and container registries. All of that kind of wrapped together, we class as a container as a service or a CAS. Uh, and we also introduced the idea that Docker Enterprise, uh, the Docker Enterprise container platform, is the kind of all, uh, like a, a is the perfect CAS for you to use both including Docker Swarm and including Kubernetes at the orchestration layer, supporting both Linux and Windows workloads at the container runtime level, and then providing management tools like the Universal Control Plane uh, and the Docker Trusted Registry. We've already talked about the fact that the Docker Enterprise Container Platform can run on any infrastructure, whether that's physical, virtual, on-premise or off-premise. We honestly don't mind. We, we come at this with a, a choice perspective. Uh, so in this particular webinar, we're going to go, uh, focus and kind of narrow in on the Universal Control Plane and how the Universal Control Plane uh, manages Kubernetes uh, on your behalf. Kubernetes is a key part of our platform. It comes installed out of the box, and we are actually a certified Kubernetes distribution. So we've passed all of the, the relevant tests to, to come out as a certified Kubernetes distribution, so you know that when you start to deploy and develop Kubernetes workloads as part of Docker Enterprise, um, you're, you're not getting locked in. We are, not, we are conforming to the open standards. We are conforming um, uh, to, to the, the kind of industry and, 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 and open source project. Uh, one thing I did want to highlight, um, this actually all came around from an announcement in DockerCon in October 2017. So we here in Docker have been embracing both Docker Swarm 
and Kubernetes in all of our platforms now for, for just over 18 months. Um, whether that's including Kubernetes as part of our community edition products in the desktop, or shipping Kubernetes as, as a key orchestrator inside of our container orchestration platform, Docker Enterprise. So first off, and let's kind of go through how Kubernetes is integrated into Docker Enterprise and how you get to take advantage of it um, when you want to start deploying your workloads. Uh, first thing, we're going to kind of look at the container platform lifecycle. Uh, Kubernetes has a, quite a reputation on, on the complexity to install, uh, kind of grow your clusters, upgrade your clusters, and then back up your clusters. And we in Docker have, have done a really good job at simplifying all of that for you, making Kubernetes really, really easy to manage on top of Docker Enterprise. Uh, we've seen many cases out there in the press that poorly configured or poorly installed Kubernetes platforms have led to vulnerabilities, whether that's people uh, exposing Kubernetes dashboards or Kubernetes API servers publicly, whether they've not uh, enabled TLS between all of their um, infrastructure, or whether they failed as part of an upgrade and ended up bringing down workloads. We here as part of Docker Enterprise take all of the stress for those kind of four key pillars of the lifecycle away for you. Um, so let's have a look at first how we handle a Kubernetes installation as part of Docker Enterprise. First off, I will say is Kubernetes is installed by default in all Docker Enterprise deployments. The universal control plane is, is the, the, the particular piece that will install and manage the lifecycle Kubernetes from that management layer. Um, one of the key things and one of the key advantages of our platform is that everything in the universal control plane runs as containers. Whether you're talking about the management tools and the management user interfaces, or you're actually talking about the Kubernetes components themselves, they will all run as containers on top of a Docker engine. Therefore, all you need is a Docker engine, a bootstrap container to start it all off, and then everything happens kind of automatically. There is no kind of pain, there is, there is no kind of Kubernetes the hard way here. All you need to do is install the Docker engine, run the bootstrap container, and then everything will be deployed for you. And when I talk about everything here, I'm talking around things like the Kubernetes control plane, uh, the Kubernetes networking stack, things like a, a, a role-based access control engine, and as well as that, the, the, the key value store where, where all of the data from Kubernetes is stored. So therefore, once you install Docker Enterprise, all of these bits are deployed for you and managed by UCP. You don't have to do any of the pain that is involved in a manual installation of Kubernetes. We automate all of that for you. So I'm going to try and do um, uh, kind of a, an interactive session as we go through the webinar today. And I'm actually going to start off a Docker installation, a Docker Enterprise installation, and keep checking back in as, as we work through um, work through the content. So uh, I'm actually going to do this particular demonstration on Microsoft Azure. As we talked about, we are absolutely agnostic at the infrastructure layer. You can run on whatever platform you'd like. Um, but in this particular demonstration, I'm going to, to, to build out and show the lifecycle of Kubernetes running on Azure. Um, you can see inside of my environment here that I have uh, a number of virtual machines. Uh, some of them are called managers. Some of them are called workers. In reality, they're, they're, they're just virtual machines running a Linux operating system. So I've, I've jumped into one of my virtual machines, the first manager. I've patched my virtual machine, and I've installed the Docker engine. So a quick version of, of Docker version, a quick run of Docker version, sorry, shows that I have the Docker engine installed. That is all the prerequisites required to install our container platform. You, you don't need any large Ansible scripts here. All you need is a virtual machine and the Docker engine. To then start off the process of a Kubernetes installation, which in reality is just a Docker Enterprise installation, all we need to do, going back to this diagram, is start off the bootstrapper container. And the rest of it kind of happens automatically. So to start off the bootstrapper container, all we need to do is a Docker run command. 
Now, I've just preloaded it inside of this, this shell script just so I don't do any typos during the demonstration. But all you can see that it's doing is a Docker container run, starting up UCP as a container image. And there we go. All of this is now part of the bootstrapper container. So I want to use an install and pass in a few variables like a password and, a, and, a, and, a, and an IP address. So that one line command will install our whole platform. It's that simple because everything runs in containers. So I'll start that off and uh, we should now start to see uh, the container platform being deployed and it's going to go through its various uh, checks before it starts to bring up the platform. Um, I did want to kind of just prove the point that everything's running in containers. And so if I did a, 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 a kind of show me all the containers that are running, you can start to see here that behind the scenes, the UCP bootstrapper is verifying that this virtual machine is ready to have an installation and it will start to deploy for me. That's it. That's as simple as it is to install Docker Enterprise and to install Kubernetes as part of our platform. Uh, this is going to take a couple of minutes to run, so I'll check back into it uh, in a minute or two. So the next part of the life cycle around um, Kubernetes as part of Docker Enterprise is how you grow your cluster. Uh, you may spend a lot of time today kind of working on scripting to do the installation of your first platform. However, if it's complex to grow, you're going to be quite scared to start to add new workloads onto it. That is not a problem as part of Docker Enterprise. As part of Docker Enterprise, you can seamlessly grow from one manager node to a fully resilient three or five manager node deployment just with one line command. And you can add as many workers as you'd like. Once again, the same one line command can add workers in. And this is all possible because we are actually running everything in as part of Kubernetes in containers, and we're running those containers on top of a Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm has a really, really good way of managing clusters. It's secure by default. It has TLS enabled. Um, it has everything stored encrypted in a, in, a, in a raft store on the manager nodes. So we're able to take advantage of, of, of the, the simplicity of, of Docker Swarm to grow our Kubernetes clusters. All we, all we will end up doing is, is, is kind of telling a new virtual machine, please join our cluster. At that point, we'll add it in. We'll start up a UCP agent. And that UCP agent will configure everything for us. It will configure TLS. It will start the Kubernetes kubelet. And it will bring up the Kubernetes networking components. Everything is, is kind of automated for you. So uh, and these are kind of the, the two line commands you'll need. To join manager nodes, it's a simple Docker Swarm join. Uh, to join worker nodes, once again, it's a simple Docker Swarm join. OK, let's check on how uh, my installation is doing and see if we can grow our, our new cluster. OK, so just jumping back in, you can see that the installation is just about finished. Uh, yep. So if I open up the web browser, navigate to my IP address, a quick refresh, and perfect, we can now see that the Docker Enterprise installation has finished. This is not pre-recorded. This is all being done live. You saw me kind of start the bootstrapper container and then install Docker Enterprise. It was that quick and easy. Uh, quickly logging into the platform and uploading a license key. Uh, you can see that I'm now into my Docker Enterprise environment. You can see straight off the bat that I have one manager node running, and I have both Kubernetes and Swarm as, as available orchestrators. I want to kind of show how easy it is to expand a cluster as part of Docker Enterprise. Um, so here you can see that I have one virtual machine running as a manager node, I want to make a highly available deployment. How quickly and easily can I do that? Well, fortunately, I have two more manager virtual machines sat here with the Docker engine installed. Perfect. They passed the prerequisite. It's a virtual machine. It has the Docker engine installed. It's now ready to be part of my cluster. So let's click on Add Node. 
I want to use a Linux virtual machine, and I want them to be manager nodes. Copy the string and paste it into these two windows. Great. It's as simple as that. You will now find all of the components for Kubernetes are going to start to be deployed onto those two virtual machines as containers. So I've gone from nothing to a Kubernetes cluster to now, hopefully with a quick refresh, you'll start to see that it's a, a, a fully resilient Kubernetes cluster as managers two and three uh, start to spin up. Once again, no complex scripting required here. I, ha I haven't had to go and learn a configuration management tool or require any, anything else. It's simple. Everything runs in containers. OK, now I want somewhere to run my Kubernetes workloads. How do I add workers to this cluster? Once again, it's a, it's a pretty simple uh, string. We, we saw it before. So just add the node, Linux, and worker. And once again, I, I have a few things staged. So I have three virtual machines sat here waiting to go, all of them with the Docker engine installed. Therefore, all I need to do to add them to my cluster again is Docker Swarm join. And remember, uh, this is, these are Kubernetes worker nodes. They are not Swarm worker nodes. We are just using Swarm to manage um, the, the, the cluster lifecycle. OK. So I've got a quick refresh, and you should see that all the nodes are now in, and they're currently working through uh, their installation. So hopefully, when I check back in in a few minutes, I should have six nodes in my cluster. OK, so next on the, on the Kubernetes lifecycle thing. So you, you saw me install a platform from scratch in a couple of minutes. You saw me take a single node cluster to a highly available cluster, and then from a highly available cluster with no workers, to a highly available cluster with, with free workers. The next kind of question is, well, Kubernetes is great, but Kubernetes is actually quite a fast-paced, moving uh, open source project. As part of Docker Enterprise, how do we handle upgrading Kubernetes? Because I realize that it has releases quite often. Well, Docker Enterprise has a patch release every month, and it has major releases every six months. Um, Kubernetes may be patched as part of a Docker Enterprise patch release, depending on how they how they sync up. But every time Docker Enterprise has a major release, we will um, uh, upgrade Kubernetes as part of that. So um, you kind of see uh, Kubernetes has as releases today three times a year. We will pick up the latest major release of Kubernetes every time we do a Docker Enterprise major release. But then the question becomes, well, how do I how do I actually pull down and upgrade my cluster? Like all that's okay, but what's the process? Like, is it very disruptive to upgrade Kubernetes as part of Docker Enterprise? Uh, and the answer to that question is is no, because everything runs in containers. We've saw all um, seen how easy it is to stop old containers and start new containers. We were able to take that same approach with Kubernetes. We will bring back up our bootstrapper. Our bootstrapper will talk to our agent and say, hey, uh, new version is available. Please roll out the new version to the whole cluster. And that's it. Simple as that. The rest of the cluster will upgrade itself. And, you, and there you're upgrading um, the universal control plane and you're upgrading Kubernetes. We have a similar process when it comes to actually backing up your cluster. We realize that Kubernetes is, is quite a, uh, a complex thing to try and understand how to secure and, and how to back up. In Docker Enterprise, we take away all of that complexity. Docker Enterprise manages the etcd key value store, which is kind of like the brains, well, not really the brains, but kind of where all the, the, the data lives from Kubernetes. Docker Enterprise handles that key value store and handles making it a highly available deployment. Docker Enterprise also handles backing up etcd. So as part of Docker Enterprise, if you want to back up your Kubernetes cluster, all we need to do, bring back up our bootstrapper container. Instead of saying uh, UCP install or UCP upgrade, we're just going to do UCP backup. And it will take a snapshot for us of etcd. That snapshot will be then saved locally 
for you to be able to restore your cluster in case anything goes wrong. One thing I will say, this is only backing up SED. We're not backing up workloads. If you have workload data stored um, in external storage systems, we won't be backing those up. We're only kind of backing up the Kubernetes components as part of SED. OK, so let's see how my cluster is doing. Quick refresh. Perfect. Everything looks green. So I've gone from having nothing to having a single manager, then from a single manager to a highly available free manager deployment, and then from a highly available free manager deployment, I then added some worker nodes. And you can see here the type of the worker nodes are Kubernetes. I'm ready to start to schedule pods. I'm ready to start to bring up my workloads. How does an upgrade work in this environment? Well, if I quickly about, you can actually see that we're running um, Kubernetes 111.7 in this particular version of UCP. Um, as this helpful banner has told me, there's a new update available. So let's see how we can upgrade the whole cluster very, very quickly. Going back to my first manager node, all we need to do is bring back up a bootstrapper container, so docker container run, UCP, an upgrade, and then the whole cluster will be upgraded for us. It's going to quickly give me a quick, are you sure you want to do this, which is a very helpful yes or no, um, and that's it. We have now, well, we will now go through the process of upgrading UCP. I, I haven't had to to, to do anything on, on all of those virtual machines. I don't have to go around the houses on every single virtual machine and patch them. I don't have to write a big config management script to handle Kubernetes anymore. All of that pain has been taken away by Docker Enterprise and the universal control plane. Um, it says it can take up to 15 minutes to do the installation. I expect it's gonna be a lot quicker than that because there's, there's no, because uh, it's only a small environment. But we'll check back in in a couple of minutes to see see what state it looks like. Okay, so hopefully at that point you've shown how easy it is to handle the life cycle of Kubernetes as part of Docker Enterprise. Uh, now we're going to kind of look at some of the other things that Docker Enterprise adds on and kind of uh, as part of a Kubernetes deployment. Firstly, looking at security and multi-tenancy. Um, one of the things that's, that's quite a, a pain when, when rolling out your Kubernetes environments is handling user management. Trying to understand what users can have access to Kubernetes and what users can't. And then trying to understand how that can integrate into your existing tooling and processes. Well, Docker Enterprise dramatically simplifies that process. Um, the Universal Control Plane runs a role-based access control engine. The role-based access control engine can integrate into LDAP, into Active Directory, or even into some SAML v2 providers such as Okta or Ping Federate. So therefore, you don't have to worry about changing your business processes when you bring on a Kubernetes platform. You integrate Kubernetes with Active Directory and then as you configure and as users and teams come and go inside of your enterprise, they are being uh, seamlessly synchronized um, to Docker. At the same time, we've made it very, very easy for um, users to integrate with uh, existing tooling with Kubernetes through something called a UCP client bundle. And we'll take a little bit more look at the UCP client bundle uh, in a demo shortly. And one thing I will say, this, this auth end component, this user management, is across all endpoints. Everything is secured from the UCP user interface to the UCP API, the Kubernetes API, um, the Kubernetes CLI, as well as the Docker Trusted Registry. Once you integrate Docker Enterprise with LDAP or Active Directory, you have security across all of the touch points of your container platform. Um, we also work hard to make it really, really easy uh, to actually handle the auth uh, Z component. 
providing the granular role-based access control on each Kubernetes object. Now, Kubernetes, if you may or may not know, has a role-based access control API, and we integrate seamlessly into that. So when you start to create roles, which, which kind of tell you what you can do, to role bindings, which match a, a role to a user, once you create those in Kubernetes or, or, or try and pull across existing deployments or uh, ISV uh, software releases onto Docker Enterprise, all of those Kubernetes APIs will seamlessly work and drive UCP. You don't have to worry about rewriting anything when bringing um, Kubernetes objects onto our platform. Uh, at the same time, um, we, uh, we, we can start to group Kubernetes resources to kind of create a multi-tenant platform through um, namespaces, which are kind of like a logical separation of pods and volumes and secrets and, and, and so on. Uh, or you can group resources uh, by a, a physical means by saying um, that application team has access to those virtual machines and the next application team has access to those virtual machines, kind of doing a, a physical grouping of resources. Both logical grouping with namespaces or physical grouping um, with worker nodes can be seamlessly integrated into the RBAC engine so you can kind of see how um, user management works. So let's have a look at a quick demonstration. Uh, here I have, actually the first thing I'll do, I'll quickly check on the progress of my upgrade. Uh, oh, success, the upgrade is done. Quick refresh of the dashboard. Perfect, we are now on the latest version of the control plane and a quick look. Oh, cool, we're on 11.8, we're on the latest version of the 1.11 branch of Kubernetes. It was that simple to upgrade Kubernetes as part of this platform. Okay, um, having a look at user management, I'm actually going to switch to a, a separate cluster. Um, and in this separate cluster, I've integrated it with an LDAP provider. Quick look, log in. You can just see here that I have some sample users and sample groups defined inside of LDAP. Um, I have integrated the control plane and therefore Kubernetes with LDAP. So as users and groups leave your organization, you don't have to worry about user management of Kubernetes. Um, so I have a user here, uh, it's called demo person. So let's log in as the demo person. Oh, type their password right. Um, and so straight away you can see that the control plane's authenticated through LDAP. And let's try and deploy something as the demo person. Well, to do so, I'm actually going to use a client bundle. Now, a client bundle um, is a set of uh, certificates and keys that UCP manage that will authenticate every single user with the cluster. So you don't have to worry about managing usernames and passwords of Kubernetes anymore. UCP handles all of that for you with a client bundle. Uh, so I've jumped to a fourth uh, command prompt, and I'm going to copy across that that client bundle I just downloaded. You can see it's a zip file, so I'm going to unzip it. You can see now that I have a set of certificates and keys which are unique to that user. We will use these certificates and keys to authenticate against Kubernetes. So uh, if I do kubectl, which is the Kubernetes command line, and I'm going to just quickly sideload in that config, which you can see is here as part of a client bundle, and uh, get nodes. Perfect. You can see that the demo person is able to talk to Kubernetes. I have given the demo person the rights to view nodes, but I've not given him the rights to view pods. If he tries to access pods, he can't. That's part of granular role-based access control. So let's see how I would give the demo person um, rights. Uh, I'm an administrator here. So I'm going to go to grants, 
I'm going to create a role binding. I'm not actually going to do an individual user. Individual users um, come and go. I'm actually going to do a team. So I'm going to say anybody who's in the developers team, which fortunately, quick look at Elder, the demo person is, um, has access to a default namespace, the logical grouping of resources, with a view pods role. So everybody who's is in the developer team in LDAP can have view pods access to these logical resources. Simple create. I've now got myself a, a new bit of um, authorization running the same command. Bang, there we go. I haven't had to download a new client bundle. You can see here that an administrator can take and remove privileges very, very quickly from individual users or teams. And that user's identity is handled via client bundles, and user's identity is seamlessly integrated uh, into LDAP. OK, keep going. Um, so what else do we do on a security side inside of uh, Kubernetes for Docker Enterprise? Firstly, we, we handle user management. But we also secure the networking stack. Now, Docker Enterprise provides a batteries included but swappable Kubernetes networking stack. And we leverage the Kubernetes Container Networking Interface, or CNI. Um, Docker are working closely with Tagira. Tagira are a company that make Project Calico. Calico by, by, um, is by far the, one of the most popular, or if not the most popular, but one of the most popular Kubernetes networking stacks. And as part of Docker Enterprise, we will handle the lifecycle of Calico for you by installing it via that bootstrapper container, as you saw, and also handling upgrades and support you get fully supported for the open source Calico project as part of Docker Enterprise. And Calico has really, really good security features. By default, for example, all Kubernetes pods can communicate with each other. If they're on the same virtual machine, if they're on different virtual machines, if they're in the same namespace or in different namespaces, it doesn't make a difference. Kubernetes operates kind of like a flattened network at the beginning. But through Project Calico, inside of Docker Enterprise, we can actually start to create network policies. Now, network policies uh, can be deployed via administrators or operators, and they can restrict what pods can communicate with other pods. They basically create kind of uh, firewall rules that reject communication going into a pod. So therefore, you can have two tenants, application team one in namespace one and application team two in namespace two, and you can prevent any network traffic kind of going between those pods. Or, for example, let's say you had two pods in the same namespace and you wanted to, to for security reasons, stop them communicating. I don't know, you wanted to stop the front end talking to the back end directly. You kind of wanted the front end to go to the middle, uh, the message bus, and then back out. Uh, then you can provide a network policy rule to stop two pods talking to each other. All of that is possible as part of Docker Enterprise with our um, uh, seamlessly integrated Calico deployment. We also kind of go one layer further on this networking security side, and that's with networking encryption. We all know that we're, we're starting to, to use more and more shared infrastructure. But how do you protect your traffic when running across this shared infrastructure? Well, we can do that with networking encryption. And networking encryption will encrypt the Calico overlays uh, between virtual machines. So for example, if a pod on, on worker number one wants to talk to a pod on worker number two, um, as part of Docker Enterprise, we can encrypt that traffic uh, so that anybody who's on the infrastructure side monitoring that communication will be unable to see what's going on inside. Because we do the encryption at the virtual machine layer, you don't, uh, all of the tenants and users don't need to worry about configuring anything special inside of their workloads. They can just happily deploy their workloads as they are, um, and uh, the encryption happens um, 
uh, seamless like without without their knowledge uh, and just kind of for those people that are curious the traffic is encrypted in the kernel uh, using IPsec capabilities of Linux so there I, I just kind of went through some of the multi-tenancy features and security features that you get as part of Kubernetes on Docker Enterprise So next, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking around application deployments. Um, if you uh, were on one of the previous webinars, you would have seen this slide before. But this particular slide talks around how uh, inside of Docker Enterprise, we use Compose to abstract application definition away from um, the, the, the kind of orchestrator that you use. If you are a developer today and you're developing applications on Docker Compose locally, you don't have to worry about converting that into Kubernetes config files or Kubernetes manifest files. The same Docker Compose files that developers are really, really friendly with can now be used to deploy your workloads onto Kubernetes. Um, Basically, when you when you write a Docker Compose file now uh, and, and try and deploy it on Docker Enterprise, you simply say, hey, this Compose file is going to be on Swarm, or this Compose file is going to be on Kubernetes. You don't have to worry about translating it. You don't have to worry about trying to understand, well, uh, a, a service in, in Docker container is, is this, and a service in Kubernetes is that. We handle all of the seamless um, migration of a Compose file to Kubernetes for you. Um, so therefore, you don't have to worry about kind of uh, how you write your applications. Developers can carry on using the tools that they they, they, they know and love today um, and roll and, and kind of use that on top of Kubernetes inside of Docker Enterprise. Um, one thing I will say, and one of the big announcements from the December DockerCon conference in Barcelona is that Docker Compose on Kubernetes is completely open source. If you want to have a look at this and see how we're doing it or, or maybe even deploy uh, Docker Compose on Kubernetes on an alternative Kubernetes platform, you absolutely can. We've open sourced all of that, that goodness on converting Compose um, to Kubernetes. Uh, one thing I will say is, is, is kind of part of this platform, if you did want to deploy applications through an alternative definitions, so you wanted to use Helm charts, for example, or Kubernetes operators, because we are just deploying an upstream Kubernetes distribution, we're not kind of, we don't have a very opinionated fork, then absolutely, you can use whatever application definition frameworks that you want. You could easily deploy Tiller on top of Kubernetes and start using Helm chart straight away. Or if you wanted to start to use the operator framework, you could do too. There is, we are not restricting you on how you want to deploy applications on our platform. However, we just know today that a lot of developers have a lot of their applications already defined in Docker Compose, and we want to make it seamlessly uh, easy to, for a developer to pick up their application that they're working on uh, in, in, in development and drop it onto production on Docker Enterprise. Um, so hopefully there you, you've seen some of the key components of Kubernetes running in Docker Enterprise. And this is all part of the wider container platform. Um, we have a Docker Desktop Enterprise, which I've shown in some of the previous webinars as a local development environment to create containers locally. And Docker Desktop Enterprise fully deploys and manages Kubernetes for you as well. So if you wanted to create Kubernetes objects as part of uh, your local development environment, you can do so in Docker Desktop. Once you've created your assets on Docker Desktop, you can seamlessly ship those uh, to either the Docker Hub, which is a public repository, or to an enterprise's Docker Trusted Registry. And a Docker Trusted Registry is obviously an on-premise or self-hosted enterprise container registry and then you can run your applications on the universal control plane and there today we, we looked in detail I've automatically joined through the audio of your computer speaker system make sure you have your speaker volume turned all the way up and note you cannot use your telephone for this broadcast 
If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the questions panel and one of our Docker experts will respond. We will also take questions at the end of the presentation. Please know this session is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording via email in the next few days. Today's session is hosted by Oliver Pomeroy, Technical Solutions Engineer here at Docker. I will now turn things over to you, Oliver. So, uh, without further ado, containerizing legacy Windows applications with Docker Enterprise. Uh, myself, my name is Oliver Pomeroy, and I'm part of the solution engineering team here uh, with Docker based in London. So if you've seen any of the previous webinars in this series, uh, you would have seen this slide before. Uh, but just to make sure we're kind of all on the, in, on the same page, um, VMs and containers, they're very different things. Uh, a container uh, is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application packaged together. Uh, once the application has been containerized, it can then run side by side with other applications as multiple containers can be deployed to the same host. All of the isolation of the container uh, is provided via the operating system. So the operating system kernel uh, is the bit that provides isolation so one application container doesn't know anything about the second application container uh, and so on. So therefore, when you can containerize applications, you can reduce your virtual machine footprint as you start to roll out more applications per host. Uh, containers can run on virtual machines. Uh, obviously, if you're running containers in the cloud, it will probably be running on virtual machines. Uh, but at the same time, containers can also run on physical servers. Uh, we honestly don't mind. Uh, the only dependency we have is on a modern operating system as a lot of the container technology is done in the kernel, uh, we just need to have a, a modern operating system to support that. So something um, Red Hat 7 or newer, or something like Windows Server 2016 uh, or newer. Once your application has been containerized, though, it can talk out normally out of the host's IP, uh, TCP IP stack. Uh, so if your uh, application wanted to talk to an external database, absolutely fine, can do, no problem. Um, it just talks out of the, the host. The kind of North Star here at Docker, the kind of vision that we have, is really to support any application running on any operating system, uh, running on any infrastructure. Uh, we here at Docker are providing abstracting, abst uh, abstraction, abstracting your application away from the infrastructure that it runs on. Uh, whether your application is a traditional application, a modern cloud-native microservice-based application, or maybe some of the more modern frameworks, something like a serverless or a, a blockchain application, we want to be able to use the Docker platform to kind of abstract all of the different application types, schedule and manage them the same way. Then at the same time, your application is now abstracted away from its infrastructure, giving you the flexibility and the agility to deploy your application wherever you want, whether that's on, on the cloud, whether that's in, as a virtual machine on-premise, whether that's in a bare metal server, or even out there on the edge or an IoT device, uh, we want to use containers to provide that agility for your applications. Uh, the Docker platform itself uh, is built on three core pillars, and, and you would have seen as you've gone through the webinar series, we look in each pillar in a bit more detail. Um, but we're, we're providing choice, the ability to, to containerize any application, treat it the same way, and then run that application on any infrastructure. Uh, we're providing agility, the ability for you to, to deploy applications quicker than ever before, um, move applications to the cloud very quickly, or maybe just scale up or scale down applications depending on demand very quickly, all using this concept of a software container. And security is absolutely key to, to us here at Docker, whether that's securely packing up your application as a container or security built into the platforms to make sure that when you deploy that application, it is as secure as possible. 
Uh, we've gone through the, the common use cases for containers or the common use cases for Docker Enterprise uh, before, but just a quick recap. Um, common use cases for, for containers include modernizing traditional applications, uh, using containers as part of a cloud strategy to migrate applications to the cloud or to prevent yourselves being locked in when you get there. Uh, people use containers to consolidate infrastructure if they want to start to reduce their virtual machine footprints and therefore reduce hypervisor costs or physical server costs, uh, they can leverage containers. Uh, customers use containers for faster application deployment and development, uh, often integrating containers into their pipeline tooling. And modernizing that software supply chain by providing um, a simple artifact at every stage of the lifecycle. So you package up your application once and it will be the same in dev, test, UAT, and production. Well, finally, one of the new use cases with containers is helping you deploy software at the edge. Whether that's a, a manufacturing site or an oil rig, uh, we're working hard to make it easier to deploy software containers out there to, to the edge. Uh, in this particular webinar series, uh, we're focusing um, on, on, on more of these cases on the left-hand side, taking legacy applications and containerizing them through um, our MTA program and our MTA technology. At the same time, once you've containerized a legacy application, you're free to move it into the cloud or wherever you'd like, or prevent yourself being locked into that cloud. Um, and you also get to consolidate your infrastructure uh, as a benefit once it's containerized. So let's look at modernizing traditional applications uh, with Docker Enterprise. Uh, if you look at the, the kind of challenges today most enterprises face with their, with their uh, legacy application estate, uh, well, first off, there's, there's kind of a fragile dependency kind of mess or, or dependency soup on, on most of their services. It's very difficult to patch and maintain um, because worrying that any changes to the operating system might break the framework and then therefore might break the application. And there's quite a, a complex thing to manage there, especially these legacy applications are often untouched and unloved for quite a lot of time. Uh, a traditional legacy application estate, there's often a, a problem around lost knowledge that the original developers or the people that deployed those applications 10, 15 years ago are no longer around or or any of the, the current uh, operations or developer teams are using very different tools to, to what was used on the application originally. Uh, and then at the same time, because Microsoft did quite a good job at, at supporting um, legacy operating systems and legacy frameworks, we're actually finding that a lot of customers are, are just uh, kind of stuck uh, or using the stickiness of Windows Server, running their applications today on older versions uh, of, of Windows Server, whether that's 2003 or, or 2008. But we all know today um, that that Microsoft Windows Server 2008 uh, end of support is coming. Uh, a slight error on the slide here, but, but the end of support date for Windows Server 2008 is January 2020, sort of nine months away from, from where we are on this webinar. Therefore, if you want to have a supported operating system from Microsoft, you're going to have to pay, pay very large extended support agreement fees or find a way to get your application estate onto a modern host uh, as quickly as possible. Which therefore brings in Docker and the Docker uh, Modernized Traditional Application Program as a way to containerize your legacy applications, move them onto modern hosts. And we can do this all without rewriting or recoding the application um, and then providing both consolidation and infrastructure and future proofing yourself by dropping you onto a, a modern operating system. Uh, so how does this all how does this all work? Well, we're actually able to run legacy frameworks on modern hosts and modern operating systems. On the left-hand side, you can see before a Docker MTA program, um, you have free applications running on free virtual machines on Windows Server 2008. A .NET 2 framework application, an IS application, and an ASP uh, Net application as well. Now, what we're able to do is package up that application and its binary and library as a software container. Um, 
And then we're able to run that on a new host. We're able to run that old framework on that new host. And one of the key things here is we're actually able to remove all of the uh, Windows Server 2008 components. You are no longer uh, running 2008 anywhere on the right-hand side. We're, we're not uh, emulating it anywhere. You're not packaging up an old kernel or an old host. There will be no kind of Windows Server 2008 components on the right-hand side of this diagram. You just get your application packaged up as a container running natively on Windows Server 2016 or 2019. This brings across uh, some, some huge benefits. Firstly, we're able to consolidate virtual machine footprint. You can see in this diagram here, we've gone from three um, virtual machines on the left-hand side to one virtual machine on the right. Uh, we've completely removed that legacy operating system. There's, there's no 2008 anywhere. And we're able to migrate these free legacy applications without rewriting them. We haven't had to spend an awful lot of money uh, getting developers to rewrite them to modern frameworks or anything like that. We're able to just lift and shift them onto 2016. Uh, we, we've done this now for, for, uh, for a lot of customers for the past year, 18 months or so. And, and the kind of results kind of speak for themselves. Whether that's consolidating infrastructure, both at the virtual machine footprint, at the operating system license level, or maybe even the operation support savings, the fact that you no longer have to patch and maintain um, this wide variety of virtual machine operating systems and the number of hosts. And then you're also now getting to take advantage of all of the productivity gains that come with containers the speed to deploy, the agility, um, the, the idea to secure your applications inside of that container, that you kind of are, are, are benefits of using the Docker approach um, that you kind of don't even realize for your legacy applications, but they now get to be treated and get to be, have the advantages of more modern cloud native applications. So let's have a look at, at Windows containers and, and the state of Windows containers here in, uh, in April 2019. So Windows containers have been around now uh, for, for quite a long time. Uh, when Microsoft announced the general availability of Windows Server 2016, uh, back in October or September 2016, um, we had Docker support from, from day one. We had the ability to now schedule Windows containers the same way that we've been able to schedule Linux containers for 20 odd years. Uh, today, how can you consume Windows containers? Well, you can consume Windows containers uh, over two methods. If you're a developer or for your developers, all you need is a Windows 10 workstation and either Docker Desktop or Docker Desktop Enterprise. Docker Desktop or Docker Desktop Enterprise provide the ability to take advantage of your local Windows 10 machine and the local Windows 10 kernel to create Windows containers for you. You don't need anything else, just download Docker Desktop and Docker Desktop Enterprise and you're good to go. Uh, unfortunately, if you're a Linux or a Mac user on your workstation, you need to find yourself at a Windows machine somewhere. Um, because we're not emulating a kernel, you, you can't containerize Windows applications if you, if you don't have a Windows kernel. Uh, for an operator, uh, the only thing you need to take advantage of Windows containers uh, is the Docker engine or the Docker Enterprise engine. Uh, this is available for both Windows Server 2016 and Server 2019, and is actually free of charge included inside of the cost of a Windows Server license. So anybody today with a Windows Server 2016 or 2019 license can take advantage of uh, Windows containers using the Docker Enterprise Engine. So how does this actually work, or kind of what, what's under the hood? So you pull down uh, the Docker Enterprise Engine, which is the container runtime component uh, that runs as a, as a Windows service. And then all we need to do is every time you want to deploy a Windows container, we will just spin up a container image alongside. The, the Docker engine is not in between the application and the kernel, so there isn't an overhead when running an application in a container. It's running natively on the host there. And then when you want to start to deploy more and more applications, you're sharing that same kernel, but you're providing that isolated environment for each application to run. So each Windows Server container doesn't know about the other one, 
uh, but the host knows about both of them. Uh, if some of you security guys out there are getting a little bit twitchy about kind of sharing a, a kernel, uh, out of the box inside of uh, Windows, you have uh, this idea of, of a Hyper-V hypervisor. And we can leverage the Hyper-V hypervisor to provide Hyper-V isolation for Windows containers. So when you bring up a container, instead of bringing up a container natively on the host, like you can see on the left-hand side or in the middle of the diagram, rather, you actually bring up a container that's packaged the same way. You don't have to do anything different, but with its own kernel in its own very, very lightweight operating system managed via Windows Server. So you don't have to worry about this little lightweight bit in the corner. That's all managed to you via Docker and Windows Server. But that application container, that legacy framework, that something that you've now dropped out in the cloud, is now actually isolated with its own kernel. So you, you still actually have quite a secure zone um, if, if you're that way. Uh, you need to do that for whatever reason. Uh, as we've gone through the Windows journey, so we're, we're kind of now um, three and a half years into the Windows container journey, uh, every time there's a new release, we've, we've got a host of new features that come up with us. Um, so right back from, from October 2016, as we've iterated all the way up to, to Windows Server 2019 that came out in, in October last year, uh, we've seen huge improvements in, in Windows container support. Whether that's on the size of container images that have uh, gone a lot more and more uh, a lot smaller throughout the generations, or whether that's enhancements around their storage or their networking stack for Windows containers as we start to get future parity between Windows and Linux containers. One of the, the big questions that come out, well, I use Windows containers, but how, how do I integrate them today inside of my Active Directory environment? All of my legacy applications or existing applications today use uh, Active Directory authentication, uh, how do I pass that into something that's so short-lived or so dynamic as a container? Well, well the first thing uh, to say is containers are not joined to an Active Directory domain. The container host is. And then what we actually do is we pass this, this idea of a credential spec into a container, and that is, is kind of the only bits and pieces we need for a containerized application to talk to Active Directory or talk to external components using the identity passed in in a credential spec. Uh, credential specs here are actually leveraging group managed service accounts. So it's kind of a service account that you're passing into your application container and it's using that service account to authenticate itself to external components like databases or, uh, or any other component in your application. Uh, the only thing you need to do to, to uh, um, support uh, GMSAs or Group Managed Service Accounts inside of your environment is have one Active Directory 2012 domain controller running somewhere. Um, at that point, you have one of those running. You can take advantage of GMSAs. You can containerize legacy applications with Windows authentication. Okay, so we've had a look at introducing Windows containers. We've, we've seen how you can use Windows containers natively or Windows containers with Hyper-V. But, but one of the next questions that come up is, is how do I use Windows containers uh, with container orchestration? Uh, there's quite a lot of container orchestrators out there in the market today. Um, for here in Docker, we, we, inside of Docker Enterprise, we have native support for both Docker Swarm and native support for Kubernetes. We honestly don't mind which one of those two orchestrators you use to schedule your application containers. Uh, orchestrators give you some, some, some big benefits when you start to roll out multiple applications in containers and start to roll out those multiple applications across multiple hosts. Uh, container orchestrators give you the ability for resource management. They are that scheduling component and uh, container orchestrators know through their service management parts which application is running where. So you no longer have to maintain these big spreadsheets to try and understand, well, that container is running on that host or anything like that. Uh, all that is taken care of for you via Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. 
Now, when you look at Windows containers and Windows containers with an orchestrator, um, there are kind of uh, the, the two clear runners here around Swarm and Kubernetes, and one slightly more mature um, than the other. On the Docker Swarm side, we've had support for Windows containers uh, since, since launch, since October 2016. Um, and we've had support inside of Docker Enterprise, our, our, our commercial product, since April 2017. So we've now got a, a few years under our belts of sort of deploying and managing Windows containers and, and running legacy applications in Windows containers. Uh, we have full support um, on uh, the various different operating system releases from 2016 all the way up to 2019, including those new semi-annual channels. And Docker Swarm nodes can, can be managers, can be workers inside of your environment. And then at the same time, if your environment had Linux and Windows workers, they could run side by side on, on different virtual machines, but join to the same cluster. The same Docker Swarm environment can schedule Windows and Linux containers uh, uh, happily. Uh, Docker, support, uh, Docker, support, Docker Swarm has full support for Hyper-V containers as well as support for things like secrets, configuration maps, uh, and volumes. And Docker Swarm also has full, full support now uh, for GMSAs. Uh, on the Kubernetes side, um, Kubernetes is recently new to the Windows container game. Uh, they've been generally available now for, for just about a month, or not quite a month. Uh, the, the Kubernetes 114 release brought in general availability of Windows containers inside of Kubernetes. However, the Kubernetes distributions, like our own inside of Docker Enterprise, uh, plan to pick up support Windows containers uh, in the second half of this year. So in the second half of this year, you can choose whether to schedule containers via Swarm or Kubernetes. Uh, today, you would schedule your Windows containers via Swarm. Uh, on the Kubernetes side, they only support 2019. They don't support 2016. And you have to run your Kubernetes control plane on Linux. Uh, you can't run it on Windows. A few other things to bear in mind is, is Kubernetes has experimental support for those Hyper-V isolated containers. Uh, one of the fundamental things inside of Kubernetes are pods. Pods are one or more containers grouped together. Uh, you actually can't support the more containers bit on, on Hyper-V today. And then finally, that, that authentication piece brought in by GMSAs uh, today is, is alpha. It is pretty early on uh, in experimental in the Kubernetes world, so we expect that to mature a little bit uh, as we kind of go through the year. But one of the key things here from, from Docker and from Docker Enterprise's point of view is we honestly don't mind which orchestrator you use to schedule your containers. We've even um, spent time working on Docker Compose and using Docker Compose to abstract your applications away from the orchestrator. So you can containerize your application once, and that will work no matter you're, you're using it on Swarm or Kubernetes. And then you can define your application once inside of a Docker Compose file. And once again, that will be completely agnostic whether you're scheduling that application uh, on Swarm or Kubernetes. We honestly don't mind. So here inside of Docker, uh, we're helping you abstract your application away, not only from its infrastructure, uh, but from uh, the container orchestrator as well. OK. Uh, so let's look at now getting started containerizing legacy applications. Uh, if you look at a, a common, applica uh, common uh, application estate, you normally find there are a couple of different architectures of applications that you see time and time again. And if I had to try and summarize or, or group these, uh, what you would find is that there are uh, loads of three-tier applications, loads of two-tier applications, and then some competing consumers. So, so uh, kind of a three-tier application would have a web layer, have an application layer, and an external database. Uh, Two-tier, you often find the web and the application tiers kind of joined together on the same host or part of the same service, and then a back-end database, and then a competing consumer where you would have some sort of message queue, some message bus, and then various .NET components of your application, once again talking out to an external SQL server. 
So when you want to start to containerize your applications, uh, there is a whole host of things that you can support in the containers. But uh, we here in Docker kind of think that it makes sense to, to pick a few applications to begin with, containerize a few legacy applications as you start to familiarize yourselves with Windows containers and has, uh, how your expertise around Windows containers grows uh, before you start to go into the uh, kind of the app factories or the, the big wide world of, of, of any application. We kind of say narrow the scope a little bit, pick some, some friendlier application architectures like a free tier or a two tier or a, a competing consumer application containerize there, understand Docker a bit more, and then go after some of the wider application estates. Um, so when you're picking those first few legacy applications to go after, um, what, what are some things that, that uh, we can kind of learn from our experience so far? Well, when picking legacy applications to containerize, um, there's, there's kind of a few things to bear in mind. On the architecture perspective, you're really containerizing applications in the .NET framework family uh, or in the Java family. Those applications are normally two free tier applications, but don't worry, we don't have to containerize the whole thing. Uh, containers can absolutely talk to external components. So if, if you pick like a, a free tier or a two tier application, then you could containerize the web tier and the application tier and do the database uh, as you would a normal traditional database migration, or maybe leave the database where it is. Or you may want to containerize uh, the .NET components inside of a competing consumer, but you wanted to leave the message queue where it was. And that's absolutely fine as well. You can absolutely mix and match the components you containerize inside of your application. Um, on the runtime side, uh, on the .NET, we would, we would look to run anything newer than .NET Framework 2.0. The, the more newer frameworks are a little bit easier to containerize, but we can go all the way back to, to 2.0. Um, and we can also include things like IIS, so Internet Information Services. Um, we can containerize IIS applications running IIS 6 or newer as well. Uh, those can be containerized alongside ASP.NET applications as well. Uh, on the Java side, we can we can containerize some of the, the, the traditional um, Java frameworks and, and web server frameworks on the Java side, like Tomcat or WebLogic uh, or WebSphere. And we can even containerize JBoss applications as well. When you're trying to work out which legacy applications to go after, um, on the dependency side, one of the, the key things to make sure that you have available to you uh, is things like the deployment artifacts or the source code. When you containerize an application, what you're actually doing is either lifting and shifting the application code into a container or installing the application again inside of a container's file system. Um, so we may need things like the installation media uh, and the deployment artifacts again. When picking those first few candidates for containerization, it's good to be really familiar with the application as you're starting to learn the Docker components. So making sure that the app owner is on board, there's a subject matter expert for the application and, and some good installation documentation to containerize that application. When we containerize the first few applications, we, we don't normally containerize the database components. And I'll, I'll talk more about SQL Server in a moment. Um, but we're normally actually just containerizing the, the web tiers, the application tiers, maybe the message bus tiers uh, inside of your application. Normally, containerizing the databases are out of scope for, for, for at the start of Docker projects. And make sure you consider the Active Directory requirements as well kind of what service accounts need to be created, what, what permissions do those service accounts need uh, when you start to run your containerized applications in containers. Finally, uh, on the implementation side, uh, make sure that there's kind of no hard-coded IPs or host names inside of the app application. When you deploy legacy applications in containers, things like networking is a lot more fluid, um, so kind of bear that in mind. And also the question around, does the deployment support unintended installations? Um, you won't have a user interface. You won't have uh, the option to RDP into a container. Um, so you're not going to be able to click next, next, next on a, on a, on a GUI, on a UI. Uh, you need to have unattended or silent installations of your application 
uh, for them to run inside of a container. One of the, the, the more common questions that come up here is, well, can I containerize COTS applications? Can I containerize off-the-shelf applications? And uh, the first question that often gets asked is, well, what's the relationship with the vendor like, or, or what's the kind of uh, T's and C's with that application? For example, would we break support by running that application in a container? Or would we break support by running that legacy application on 2016 or 2019? That's kind of the first question, and, and sometimes uh, the vendors are happy to engage and talk around that. Other times, uh, the actual applications are out of support, so running them in a container isn't a problem themselves. Uh, you also need to bear in mind the licensing consideration as well. We don't want to break any licensing um, or EULAs or anything like that when running the application in a container image. And right now as well, actually, many of the ISVs are providing certified images of themselves, uh, of their applications themselves, um, publicized normally on the Docker Hub. So today we have people like Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, SAP, all releasing containerized versions of their application that you can just consume. You don't have to worry about uh, containerizing, uh, I don't know, WAS yourself. You could go and take the WebSphere application server uh, straight from the Docker Hub. Uh, containerizing SQL Server. So I did mention as part of a, a legacy application project, we do not containerize the SQL Server components. Um, the, the reason for that uh, is, is because the, the SQL Server container images that are produced by Microsoft for both Linux and Windows um, are full fat SQL Server instances, however, primarily used for development and testing. Uh, understanding how to deploy SQL Server in high available deployments and, and understanding the persistent storage element of SQL Server is kind of still going through uh, the kind of best practices are still emerging and maturing. Uh, today, as part of legacy application projects, we only containerize uh, the web tiers and the application tiers. Um, now, one of the, the questions that often come up is, is, is how can Docker help? in automating the process to containerize your application. Uh, Docker have, have, had a first generation tool called Image to Docker, which can help you containerize Windows applications. Uh, we now have a, a, a new tool uh, for this called the Docker Application Converter. When using Docker's services or any of our certified partners and systems integrators, uh, they will have access to DAC, the Docker Application Converter tool. Uh, DAC runs on a legacy virtual machine and using its pluggable detectors of things like IIS or Tomcat or, or, or WebSphere, we were able to identify the application and containerize the legacy application for you. You will basically create a Docker file um, which will define what that application looks like in a container and containerize the application um, for you. DAC is available as part of any Docker services engagement or as part of any of our certified partners. So, an awful lot of slides there, but let, let's jump straight into a demonstration around understanding how all of this works in practice, how we can take a legacy application uh, and containerize it. So, um, let's jump to a Windows Server virtual machine. So here I have on my um, remote desktop an old, make sure it's not timed out, it looks like it may have done, try again, one second, looks like it timed out, but it's back, okay, um, we now have an old Windows Server 2008 uh, uh, virtual machine, that virtual machine is running a jobs application on IIS. So this is a, an old version of IIS Manager, as you can see, and we've got ourselves a legacy jobs application. Now, this is a two-tiered application, so the application has a, a wonderful user interface that you can see here, and it's connected behind the scenes to a, a database component. Database component is running on a, on a separate virtual machine. 
So what we want to do is we want to be able to lift and shift this application. I don't want to rewrite it to a newer framework. I, I don't want to, to try and understand the application. I just want to lift and shift it as quick as possible so I can remove 2008 from my environment. Well, the first thing that I've done here is I've preloaded the DAC tool. Now, um, the DAC tool is now running uh, here. So if quick look inside of my uh, directory, you will see I have DAC sat here, ready to go. Now, DAC is our application converter tool. Um, and this is a, a kind of a binary that we can use to containerize. I'm just going to use the DAC discover here to um, have a look inside of my environment. I'm going to do a DAC discover, and then I'm going to tell it which file system to use. So I'm going to use uh, DAC discover and the C drive. Off it goes. Um, first thing it comes back, it said, OK, do you want to uh, look through the server and containerize each application we find individually? Or do you want to try and group as many applications as you can together? Uh, I, I just want to do one container per application. So it's just a standard DAC mode will work for me. Ooh, I didn't run this in a privilege prompt. Give me one second. Switch to a privilege prompt. And switch back to the right directory. And we'll go again. That discover, and off we go. So what is now done for me is it's gone through my server. It said, OK, you're running on 2008. DAC said, I'm, I'm going to look for Tomcat, IS, WebSphere, and WebLogic containers for you, uh, applications for you, rather. It's gone through and looked in the traditional places where those applications live. And it said, OK, well, I found two applications running on, on, on this server, the default website and the jobs application that we looked at before. Do you want to containerize any of those? Yes, I do. Uh, which one do I want to containerize? I want to do IIS1 jobs. And off I go. So what that would have done for me is it would have had a look and identified um, what, what kind of version of IIS that I'm running, where the application actually lives on the host, and it would have copied all of that to a nice directory for me. And it also would have built out a Docker file. So if I cd to that directory, uh, session one, you can see that I now have my application called jobs and I have a Docker file all containerized or grouped together. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually build the container image on this host. Windows Server 2008 does not have the underlying technology to support containers. Uh, so it can't build the application here, but it's identified where the what the application looks like, the source code, and a Docker file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just that bit and move it across to a uh, new host. So jump out of there and reconnect to a 2019 server. Great. And now on this new 2019 server, I'm going to containerize my application. This is just a, a Windows Server 2019 box um, that I'm going to use to build my containerized application. A quick look uh, inside of here. Um, let's have a look. Just, uh, a quick look. You can see that inside of jobs, uh, I have the application source code on from the other server and the Docker file. The Docker file would have automatically been written via DAC to Docker's best practices. So just me opening up that now, you can kind of see uh, what we've done is we're going to start from um, the, the uh, ASP.NET image. We're going to remove the default IIS site. We're going to install some features and then copy across my application code. 
first thing that I, I need to do on 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 uh, on my side, I'll quickly set some variables. Um, is build that application into a container. We know to build an application in a container, all you need to do is do Docker image build and point it to a directory where the Docker file lives. A quick run of that command will build that application in a container locally. Right now that you can see that we've built the application, it was quick because uh, it was all kind of cached, um, but it's built a container image for me uh, called this. I can now run my legacy application natively here on Windows Server. Uh, I'm literally going to do a Docker container run and start up that application in a container. Oh, right. I now see an error. So what's just happened is I've started up an application in a container. If I, if I do something like a Docker container list, uh, you can see that I have my application started 18 seconds ago, um, which is, is my legacy application. However, when I open up Chrome and browse to my, my, my container, I see an error. That's because I haven't got my Active Directory authentication sorted. I've only containerized the application. I haven't generated my service account or my service account spec. Now, fortunately, this is a demonstration, so we've already gone to our Active Directory guys and they've created a service account for us. Um, so I can, I can quickly um, create a credential spec off that service account. Quickly do that and create a new credential spec. And if you are curious to see what a credential spec actually looks like, um, bring that down. Uh, the credential spec right now is, as you can see, it's just a bit of JSON, but it just gives a name of my uh, service account which is job CMSA, and the various scopes that they have inside of my environment. Um, what I need to do now is I'm going to restart my container. So stop the previous one, restart it again, um, but this time I'm going to pass in. You can see pass in a credential spec file. Grab all of this good stuff and rerun it. Ooh. Perfect, uh, it's now coming starting up, and we're now hopefully going through all the IIS processes. Excellent, we now have my application running. It's running locally on my Windows Server 2019 virtual machine. So what I've just done is I've taken an application from 2008. I've run DAC to identify the application code and the framework that it's running on. I've then brought my application code and a pre-built Docker file to 2019 built it locally, and then passed in a service account so that the same application can talk to the previous backend. But the backend hasn't changed between these two application tiers. However, one's running on 2008, and it's about to go end of support. Uh, the, this one running on 2019, and I'm good to go now for, for a long, long time. OK. So that was a bit of a demonstration. Uh, just to kind of finish off the, the presentation here, um, all of that is exposed and part of the Docker Enterprise Container Platform that we've talked about in this webinar and previous webinars. The Enterprise Container Platform includes both our desktop products around Docker Desktop Enterprise that enables developers to containerize their application locally. It includes the Docker Trusted Registry, a form in which we can share our containerized applications. Uh, and it includes the universal control plane, a place to securely run your application via Swarm or Kubernetes inside of the data center or the cloud. All three of those components are packaged up inside of Docker Enterprise. And in the latest Forrester Wave, you can clearly see here that Docker's enterprise platform uh, is leading the way in enterprise container platform software. If you want to know more about this and, and follow up deeper dive sessions on some of today's topics, uh, head out to San Francisco in a few weeks' time and see us at DockerCon 2019. Uh, the, the register URL is just there on the screen where you can sign up today um, and, and I'll see you all in San Francisco. Well, that's it. Thank you. And, and thank you for watching the webinar series. Um, we've kind of gone through all of our presentation content and now the team will handle 
uh, some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. We will now open things up for Q&A, as Oliver said. We have Stephen Follis online, Docker Solutions Engineer, and he is here on hand to take your questions. So if you haven't already, please post your questions in that questions panel. Uh, Stephen, have you had a chance? Are you looking through? you see any questions that you can share with us now? I sure have. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Oliver, for being with us today. Um, so a couple questions that I wanted to kind of touch on that came out of the Q&A during this session was uh, really around the different types of applications that are really appropriate for containerization. And so just wanted to kind of call out that when we're talking about containerizing applications, be them Windows-based Windows, Windows -based apps or Linux-based apps, these are typically headless or server-side applications, so not things that are desktop client-based, so not uh, WPF, Windows Form, Silverlight, things that require a desktop context to be able to run. Um, that said, for a lot of solutions, we often see where there's a client-server relationship. So you've got an older WinForms application that talks to a back-end um, server-side application. We can oftentimes containerize half of that solution, the, the server-side pieces, and then users can then use their same clients. They're just talking to a containerized back-end. So that was one of the pieces I wanted to, to comment on. Um, also, from a different from the types of applications, we're also looking at those that um, are, are typically not the the largest, most complex applications out there. So we often get questions around, "Hey, can I go containerize all of SharePoint, uh, or all of SAP, or all of PeopleSoft, or these, these very large, complex apps?" Uh, and so, oftentimes, uh, there's a, a technical reality of can we get them to run in a container? Most of the time, yes, or we can at least get close. Uh, but oftentimes, we're running into a, a, um, licensing considerations as well. So for enterprise software uh, that are coming from third parties or, or consumer off-the-shelf sh off software, there's oftentimes supported configurations for those applications. And so sometimes they say, hey, it doesn't really matter how you deploy. Other times they say it must be on bare metal or a virtual machine. So license consider is it, considerations always come into play when we talk about containerizing uh, different kinds of applications. Oftentimes, these are much uh, more relaxed for non-production environments. So if I'm looking to stand up a, a developer environment of a particular application suite, um, oftentimes we can containerize the application, have it up and running, and while it may not be supported for full production use, at least as a developer or as, in a, as a non-production user, I can get a, an instance of that environment up and running in a very easy way with containers. Uh, one of the other kind of topics that often comes up is around, hey, I, you know, I'm developing on a, a Windows-based machine, either Windows 10 or Windows Server 2016, uh, but I want to work with, with Linux containers. And so uh, typically we, we have a one-to-one -one mapping where a Linux container runs on top of a uh, on a, a to, on top of a Windows Server environment, Windows container to Windows Server host, and likewise a Linux container on top of a Linux server. Um, however, there is a feature inside of Docker Desktop that we call Linux Containers on Windows, or LCAL. And so what LCAL allows us to do is, is as a development tool, it allows someone that's developing on a Windows environment to actually run Linux-based containers. So we, get, we can kind of get around that one-to-one -one mapping for development workloads. This is not a tool that's sp really specific to production workloads, but as a developer, if I want to work on a Node.js-based application or Java or Python, something in a Linux container, I can run that on my desktop with, with Docker Desktop. So that gives some developer flexibility uh, that we can see. Um, as far as uh, some Windows specific things inside of containers, uh, so we have the entire Windows registry that is available inside of containers, so if your application needs to set or interact with registry properties, we can do that inside of the container by setting those inside of the Docker file. Uh, the Windows event log is available inside of the container, so you, if your application is writing into the event log, uh, we can pull logs out of that container to see uh, what that application is logging. And so that's also um, something that we have available inside of the container. Uh, so I'm seeing some other con some questions rolling in. Um, Want to get some information around? Let me have just a moment to read through some of these. Uh, so for se security concerns, so when it comes to uh, the questions around how older versions of IIS, so so when we containerize an IIS-based application, we're actually taking the application that's running today in an older version of IIS, an IIS six or seven type environment. 
and we actually decouple that application from the underlying operating system and that underlying uh, web server. So we take the application away, and when we containerize it, it's running essentially on top of a Windows Server 2016 or 2019 environment on top of a modern version of IIS. So we're actually not bringing forward old, outdated web servers. We're actually able to use uh, more modern-based environments for that application. So we can get around some of the security vulnerabilities or some of the security pieces that we have there. Um, so from a, let's see what else we have here. Uh, so, so, so the, the Docker Application Converter is, is part of the Docker Enterprise platform, and so it's, it's used by our customers that have a, a Docker Enterprise license. Part of that license is the ability to gain access to that Docker Application Converter. It's part of our, our broad suite of, 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 of components there, so starting from Docker Desktop all the way to our Universal Control Plane, Docker Trusted Registry, Docker, Docker Application Converter is part of that Docker Enterprise family that's there. Um, so from a maturity perspective with LCAL, uh, this is another area where, you know, it's very mature from a dev perspective, uh, but even Microsoft, you know, this is an area that we, we co-develop with Microsoft. It's an area where even Microsoft has really kind of said this is more of a dev type tool, not really intended for production type workloads. There's still, uh, you know, some performance considerations that are kind of blocking